uh, let me take this down because again this year and I know we have new people and it, it still messes my mind up because I'm I'm still like underneath I don't hate to say this underneath I'm like kind of like a Christian like I got a little small piece like you know I'm trying to kill it all but Pesach for us or Passover for us again this year is probably going to fall towards the end of February. And like last year, people was like, what? February? And no, no, it's in April. And no, 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 it's in March. And we got the, we got two different calendar classes on the YouTube channel. So you can sit at your leisure and dissect those calendar classes. But we can't do anything by the Roman, a.k.a. Babylon calendar. So when you set Rome as your center, it's going to seem like we're off. It's not that we're off. It's they're off. And just to give you like a, a just a, a preview of what I mean by the Romans, aka the Babylonian calendar is off. Uh, uh, somebody pull up Enoch, Enoch seventy two. You know what? I know everybody don't have. It. I, I get one online. I, I do the parallel. I just want to give you a little bit of taste of what the Most High has been revealing these last uh, couple of years. And I know every year it throws people off, like. Is it really Pesach now? It's like, you know, do the best you can to, to, to get understanding, but we like to show receipts. I like to show you everything we do so you know you're not following uh, a made up doctrine. We, we had enough of that inside the church. We had enough of that inside the church. So I'm gonna pull up this site, and this site has three different versions of Enoch side by side. And let me pull up the, the the luminaries, Enoch 72. If you have a copy of Enoch, uh, there's several different translations and versions. And unfortunately, that's what you got to go through trying to get the truth. But there's one version that's totally off, written by a sun worshiper named Charles H. Charles. If you have anything written by Charles H. Charles, he's a sun worshiper, he's a Catholic priest, and he adulterated Enoch's uh, writings. So be mindful of that if you have uh, anything by him. The one here. So Enoch, Enoch was taken around the luminaries, and the, the angel showed him the orders of the luminaries and gave him the most high's order of the year, and Enoch records things, but all these records that we're reading, they're in the hands of pagans. So when we get these, these writings now, we have to filter everything through uh, a Hebraic lens. So this one site here, and, and I'll try to post it in the chat, but this is the best site I came across this has three different versions of Enoch side by side. Um, can somebody hit that back light for us? The water would buy. And I don't want to make this a full calendar class. So just for your benefit, this column here to the far, I guess it's your far. Once I, hear, when I, once I spend this, I may need y'all to, to navigate on your screens for me. Is it better now? Can I see it? I'm going to try to magnify it. I know. So, 
to that. So we're going to go to, so this is three Enochs, three parallel copies of Enoch. And they all have been translated by pagans, but this copy on the, this column right here, to the far left is by R.H. Charles. He's a sun worshiper. That meant he was under the, the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. And they worshiped the sun. So he changed some of Enoch's writing to favor sun worship, telling people that the sun controls the year. And that's a lie, the sun don't, don't, don't control the year. So this column right here that you see the arrows in, this is the adulterated copy of Enoch by R.H. Charles, a sun worshiper. These two on the end, they were written by pagans too, but they, they stayed true to the Ethiopic copy. The, the original was found in Ethiopia. So the one in the middle and the one at the end, most times they agree, but disagree with the sun worshiper, right? So I want to take you to where he says, how many days are in a year? Is that one Charles or the other guy? The one in the middle is, uh, his name is Lawrence. His last name is, his name is Richard Lawrence. This right here in the middle, this is Richard Lawrence. This one on the end here, his name is uh, Scoob. Scoob, I, I, I have his copy here in the Bible. I don't have uh, Lawrence's copy, but I do have this copy at the end. R.H. Charles, I downloaded his copy and it threw people off and, and it's just a work of Satan family. This is what we got to go through. So I want to get to when he says how many days are in a year. And I want to show you how we're behind enemy lines. So this is chapter 72, depending on your copy, 72, it could be 73. So in the one, we're just going to ignore this one on the end because it's a daughter rated. And we're going to read from the two, the one in the middle and the one on the end. So this is Enoch chapter 72, and what's that verse 16? First, where he just comes out and tell you that the year is 364 days. What verse is that? 32. 32. He said the year is complete and perfect justice. 42. This is from the uh, speaker app. What chapter is it? Chapter 72, verse 42 in the secret app. Breaks down the math. Here we go. So, can someone start here at those times? At those times, there is an excess of 30 days belonging to the sun. In five years, all the days belong to each year of the five years when completed amount to 364 days and to the sun and stars belong six days, six days in each of the five years, thus 30 days belonging to them. So that the moon has 30 days less than the sun and stars. Uh -huh. The moon brings on all the years exactly. What brings on all the years exactly? The moon brings all the years exactly. But if you read this version to the left that I, that I have, I have um, high, hidden, he's going to say the sun. And that's what threw a lot of people off. And that's what a lot of people don't understand during sun worship. But these two witnesses towards the end of this website, they say the moon brings in the years exactly, right? Now, 
for the sake of time, again, I just want to get to where he comes out and says it. Verse 12 in chapter 74. Look, 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 stop. Where we at? Because um, the chapters are off a little keep bit. Going down, keep 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 going down. Keep going down. Keep going down. Uh, you got to navigate for me. Uh, no, okay, so yeah, here's it. I thought I, I uh, oh. If you got okay. the hard copy, also go yeah, to. Yeah, In my hard, I think this one is the adulterated one on the hard uh, copy, and then on my phone we got the Cipher. But yeah, in here is seventy four. So you have to if you go up. To, I think if you go up to the one on the left, the adulterated one, you should see it going across. So if you go back to the one on the left and go back to seventy four. And go to first uh, chapter twelve, and then scroll back over. You should see it. So right there, it says, it says um, if you want to start at verse ten or eleven, but verse twelve says, "And the sun and the stars bring in all the years exactly." So he's reading right here, family. And then yeah, seventy three. So it started from that first, the moon. You want the adulterated one? No, no, on the screen. Can you see the screen? The moon brings on all the years exactly that their stations may come neither two forwards nor two backwards in a single day. The moon is the master timepiece, and we brought that out last year on Pixar. Regardless of what they're telling you, the moon is the master timepiece. Read on but that the years may be changed with correct precision in 364 days. How many days? 364 days. Now, is this where he tells you the weeks to? On the verse, and, and just so you know, the other version says the same thing here. The year is complete in 364 days. So we have 364 days in our year, right? How many does Rome say they have? 365. 365, right? Now, what's the verse where it says, in, in the year is complete in 52 weeks? 50 in two weeks. Y'all see that verse? The year is complete in 50 in two weeks. Where's that one at? I didn't have this plan, so, so uh, family, just bear with me. I just want to show you the, the adorations, why things seem weird when you come back to the Most High. There's one verse Enoch says, and the year is complete in 50 and two weeks, and then it's recorded again in Jubilees. It's recorded again. The most high year constitutes 364 days, not 365. And then he said there's going to be 50 and two weeks in our year, right? Now, yeah, I got it in Jubilees, but um, Enoch. I thought Enoch said it too. That's going to be the nail in the coffin for these wicked Babylonians. We have 364 days, not 365. So while he's looking for that, let's just, just entertain some simple math here, right? If Rome or Babylon is telling us that they, they're keeping a calendar of 365 days, and our calendar says, or Yah says 364, they're adding a day, right? Now entertain me. One day times what? 12 years? No, one day times 360. How many days in a year? 364. So multiply that, that one day they added by 364 days, you're going to get in. Family, just those coming in, just trying to mute yourself. I don't know who that is. So if they're adding a day to their calendar, how many years is going to take them to add on a whole year? 364 years, right? 
you done added a day every year. So in 364 years, your calendar has an extra year. Y'all follow me? Because I only see one person shaking their head. Y'all follow me? So now you take 364 years, y'all telling us it's 2,000 years since Hamashiach died. So just like math, how many 364s you, you fit inside 2,000? About four, maybe five? So in these 2,000 years since Hamashiach died, y'all done added a day for about four, four or five times. Maybe seven times. Y'all done added a whole year to, the, to your account. Y'all see where I'm going with this, why you can't trust the Babylonian calendar? Now, did you find that verse about 50, 50 in two weeks? Yeah, not at Enoch. So it's not at Enoch. It's in Jubilees? Okay, let's do that then. Because Now I went down this rabbit hole that I want to show the people. This is why things look weird when you come back. Was it Jubilee 6? And then there's a... Yeah, yeah. Y'all got to be my eyes. Where am I at? Jubilee 6. It's in my history. That's not the one I want. Uh, what is this? I think that'll work. Can you see it? Uh, what verse is it? 30. 30. So if you're not familiar with Jubilees, it is part of the Dead Sea, Scroll, Dead sea Scrolls. And we can find some of our uh, so-called New Testament elders quote from Jubilees. Not directly, but you, you, know they're, you know they're getting that information from Jubilees. So the book of Jubilees is a valid book. It says, Jubilees 6 and 30? Uh-huh. It says, And all the days of the commandment will be two and 50 weeks of days, and these will make the entire year complete. So according to Abba Yah, a year is complete for the most high year in 50 and two weeks, right? Let's do this. We did this before. This is part of the counter to class. We did this before, too. For a yearly calendar, sorry, I said, uh, I'm gonna show you now the Alba Yah. We just showed you that Alba Yah says a year is complete in 52 weeks. And I want you to do this on your own time, and the class is on the YouTube channel. Uh, here we go. I think this is it. Ooh, this is it. This is time and day. This is not even a deep, deep scholarship, right? So Abba Yah said that his year is complete in how many weeks? 52. 52, right? And according to Abba Yah, how many days constitute a week? Seven. Seven, seven days. Six work days, and then that seventh day is Shabbat, but that's a week. That's a group of seven, right? So Here's the current calendar for the pagans, Romans, a.k.a. Babylonians, right? Y'all see they started their year with a Saturday, and people think this is a Shabbat. But according to these Babylonians, a.k.a. Romans, they're going to count this as a week. So this is going to be one week, two weeks, three weeks. But according to Abba, yeah, this is not a week. So let's do this. Here's one, two, three, four, five, six so-called weeks that are not weeks. Y'all see where I'm going? Now, this is just for year 2022. I said, you know what? I said, let me go back and see when, if I can help them out. I said, let me see if I can help them out. I said, let me go back 20 years. I said, let me go back 20 years and see if they ever had a year that was 52 weeks. I said, 2010. It's 20, it's 20. It's 20. So called So I said, let me go back to year 2000. I said, let me go back to 2000 and see what they're on point in 2000. Here's their Babylonian, aka Roman calendar in 2000. According to the Most High, his year is complete in 50 and 2 or 52 weeks. According to Albert Yah, a week is, is a group of seven. 
You work six days and you rest on the seventh, but to establish that system, you have to identify the new moon. That's the father's system. And he says, once you do this, your year is complete in 364 days, and it's going to equal 52 weeks. These Babylonians, I mean Romans, you don't even have week, 52 weeks in your calendar. So when you come back to the original, if you're stuck in Babylon, say, man, something's off. No, we're not off. I was not off. The Babylonians are off. So here's 20, year 2000. Where was y'all at in 2000? Yeah, like school too. Yeah. I was about to turn five. You mean 1940? <laughs> <laughs> Is it 2000 or the 1940s? <laughs> the Romans, the Romans added, the Romans took away like a hundred years from their calendar. We don't even know what true year it is, family. But for the point of this de demonstration, here's the year 2000. And again, they started their year on a Saturday, and they're gonna call this a whole week. But this is not a week. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's go to December. December ends on one day. <laughs> so in 2000, you didn't have 52 weeks. So that says, you know, I'm at the plantation. So, you know, they, I know they're ready to fire me any day now. <laughs> they, they like <laughs> Speaking of that, I meant to, to point this out. Go back to December. My yeah, you got some. Which one? The, the wireless? That's a four, number four. Let's go ahead and feed that. If you go back down to December, because I had thought about this, uh, and um, we had talked about it, but so how the 31st ends in one day, they consider that a whole week. Come. They're going to turn right back around January the 1st and consider that same sequence of days as a whole week. Of week. <laughs> So when you come back to Abba Yah and people who the different assemblies are not learning the same things, like, man, I don't know. Like, I know you don't know because we're behind enemy lines. We're behind enemy lines. So that's what it's going to be when you come back to Abba Yah, even inside the Hebrew community. It's like, I don't know, something ain't off. Show your receipts. Show your resources. Show your resources. Somebody online had a comment? Yeah, it's lucky. It's lucky. Well, um, uh, how 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 to simplify this when I'm like showing somebody, I'll give them something that they understand. You know, we use illustrations, right? A lot of times we use sports illustrations. That always works, right? Um, but I'll use money in this situation. So, if if you lay out one dollar, a dollar bill, obviously, yeah, that's one dollar. If you lay out four quarters. Obviously, that's one dollar. But if I put out one quarter and I say that's a dollar, obviously they'll be like, "No, that is not no dollar." <laughs> that's not a dollar. That's why they they got marketing trick to get you to spend money. Oh, it's just ninety nine cents. You know, ninety nine cents. To them, they know I'm getting a dollar out of this person. But it's not a dollar to you. But to them, they know you're going to hand them a dollar. So. Here's the year, the pagan year, the Babylonian year, the Roman year of 1800. None of us was around 1800s. They still ain't got it together. Here's the year 1800. This is probably the 1800s now. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know what year these Babylonians are in. But here's the, the Roman or Babylonian year of 1800. January started with four days. That's not a week. January ended with six days. That's not a week. So you got one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's see how they ended. Seven, eight. These people haven't had 52 weeks ever. Ever. <laughs> when you go away from the most high, and, and, and uh, what was his name? What was the first emperor? Julius. Julius Caesar, they told us his name was Caesar. His name is Caesar. Julius Caesar was the first one that says, kill anybody going to see the new moon. I'm going to tell you when the equinox is. I'm going to tell you when y'all going to have Easter. Well, Mr. Caesar, we don't celebrate Easter. So now us coming back, we look like weirdos. It's like, y'all in February? Yeah, because all we know to do is count 12 moons. Once I count my 12 moons, 
I don't care what Rome is doing. I don't care about no equinox. I don't care about no, uh, it got to be under the first Sunday the full moon. Where's that in Torah? So I, I took y'all here to show y'all, it seems weird when you're coming out of Christianity. It still messes me up because I, I grew up in the 80s where Easter break, we got off school for a week. And then when my mom got paid, we go Easter shopping. So it's messing my head up still that, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's February. So that this is the level of, of research you got to go through to come out of Babylon. You got people saying come out of Babylon, but you have a pay sock in April. You're adding 13 months and you can't show me not one verse to add 13 months. I put it on Facebook from the class of last year. According to their rhythm, I'm pretty sure they're going to have 13 months this year. I'm pretty sure they're going to get a negative barley report saying that the barley is not right. So we got to add a month to the barley get right. Book, chapter, and verse. So this is the level of study we go through to show people to come back to Abba Yah, you have to really come out of Babylon and you're going to be a weirdos to everybody around you, even inside the Hebrew community. Because you got monkey see, monkey do. Why do you say that word? I don't know. The simply taught me that word. You should have been indoctrinated. You might as well go back to church. Why do y'all keep pace out when y'all do? I don't know the assembly. We got grown men doing this. Grown men are just following the crowd. And I'm following Hamashiach. Tom? So that's just, and for more details, we went, we go into data, greater detail in the, in the class. Um, I believe it's, it's a couple of classes, but if you look on a YouTube channel for, um, the moon is the master timepiece. Uh, when does the Hebrew day start? Those series go over the calendar in great detail, showing you that when we forsake everything that Rome taught us, a new day starts at midnight. What kind of madness is that? And then they say, okay, no, a new day doesn't start at midnight. No, the Hebrew started a new day at sunset. No, we don't. At sunset, it's just the night watches. So it's still going to be the 12th. But when the sun go down, it's the night watches of the 12th. We don't change our account sundown to the 13th. Who does that? This is the level of study that we're under when we come back to Abba Yah. If you're not strong-minded, if you're easily swayed, you're going to fall to peer pressure. You're back in a cult. We got a bunch of Israelite cults popping up because I'm just coming in off the street. I see that we, okay, and now they're doing this, and now I can't ask no questions. If that teacher doesn't have holes in their hands and feet, you should feel comfortable. Hey, can you show me this? Oh, hey, I found this. What about this? If they're telling you to sit down, you don't know what you're talking about, if they just make you feel intimidated when you can't ask questions, you're in a cult. You're in a cult. You'll get it. Mm. Yeah, you, you'll get it in due time. That, that's cult talk, family. You should be able to ask questions. If you don't see it, like in school, hey, teacher, I don't see it. Can I come out to class? Can we ask? So I can see it. Or if you turn out to be right, because you could be right. If you turn out to be right and you got your receipts in order, you should share with the family. Hey, I found something. And we should be able to say, hey, y'all, let's take a look at this together. And it's all praises. The right or what's right? We got to correct what we're doing. That's when you got the nation at heart. Hallelujah. So that's coming up. Uh, just bear in mind, I think pay size is going to fall late, late February this year. Um, other than that, I don't have any, 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 uh, celebrations, birthdays, anniversaries. Um, we don't have any hard dates yet, but, uh, Yasha Yas is in charge of it. We're trying to, um, why is this camera looking like this? We're organizing a, um, a men's fellowship. And it's not just for the Torah group. It's going to be um, any any righteous person, Hebrew, Gentile, that's really walking the wall. Not these fly-by nights and coming up with a, your, your homemade brew doctrine in, in the bathtub. No. <laughs> Men who are really serious about this walk and serious about being righteous. We want to have a men's fellowship, a men's retreat uh, when the weather gets a little bit warmer. Uh, just really keep you posted as Yashi Yah gets the details together. Uh, but... It's all in, in hopes we're going to stand and fall by the men of our nation. And if the men are puffed up and can't be corrected, and the men are cocky and arrogant, the whole nation is going to be that way. So this is what we got to get the men together. 
Humble yourself under the most high by his son, and let's come together because it's about to be mayhem out here, family. And we need righteous, strong men to lead these people, not men trying to collect super chats, trying to collect multiple wives. We got time for that mess. Having a baby over here costs two thousands and millions of dollars, and you want multiple wives? Get out of here, this mess! Come on, man, you might got time for that. Well, I need some help around the house. Adam had a whole garden to tend to. How many wives do one most high in him? He had all the animals to keep in order, but you need some help around the house. Would you get off that PlayStation help help around the house, Mister King of the Castle? So um, that's all I got, family. Uh, Paryam is going to be uh, next Saturday, next Pagan Saturday, here at the Bayard. Uh, the menu is always open. If you bring your favorite dish. If you, you know, if you can't cook, you can buy something. There's nothing forbidden. We can have sweets, snacks, alcohol, uh, light alcohol if, you're, if you've got a problem with alcohol. So if, you, that's, if that's your uh, kryptonite, don't come up here with no Jack Daniels and no, no Hennessy. Then we got to... Rebuke you. <laughs> nah. So, uh, but nothing's forbidden for, for a party. Um, so, we'll be celebrating next week. And, like I said, the menu will be open. You bring whatever you bring, uh, buy whatever you buy, and we'll celebrate party next week. Um, if all hearts and minds are clear, we're going to go into today's uh, study. I want to take up your time next week because you still want to be there. Yeah. You don't think it's gonna be? If not, we push can, it back. I'm, I, I'm gonna still be here, but I don't. I didn't know how you want to. Yeah, we're just gonna push it back. Push it back. Just your next Saturday off. You can do that. Okay. I'll, I'll just keep you up. Okay. I mean, if, if it's not, we can just go ahead and do next week. Uh, well, I know for sure I'll be here next week, but it, it does. It's whatever. Because what we can do. What we can do, we can start class super early that day for you you teach at like nine o'clock from nine to two, whatever, and then we can go to Paryam afterwards. That's whatever you decide. Come, so because I, I think uh, we all are under battle. So next Saturday, class will start at 10 a.m. Where my, where my old school Sunday church at? Sunday crowd at? Y'all remember Sunday school? Yes. Be a Sunday school at 1045. <laughs> so next next Saturday, class will start at 10 a.m. Tazabat uh, Naraya will be presenting. And then after his class, we have intermission, a little light lunch or whatever. And then we're going to the Feast of Paryam. Hallelujah. So now, if, oh, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for being flexible. Now, if all hearts and minds are clear, want to uh, buckle in, get your snacks, get your water if need be. We're going back in to the class uh, uprooting Christianity and uprooting, tearing down all kind of false doctrines. And y'all bear with me, the Holy Robot guidance, because I left my notes at the job. But this, this, this class, this study is very important because we want to we want to destroy every image of a godly man. We grew up in church in the image of a godly man. He wears a suit. He speaks well. His wife looks good. His children are well mannered, and he gets the big chicken at the church dinner. He gets the uh, parking lot parking spot closest to the church. And it's like when you read our scrolls, that's not the definition of a leader. A leader, you suffer, you fast if the other people haven't eaten yet. If, if you don't have enough uh, parking spaces, you, you take the walk and let the people uh, get the closest. We have to rewrite everything we've been taught in this, this world, what's holy. I got a class that I told you, I'm tired of this class. I'm already ready to go into something else. Uh, but the most high God is here, and we have to stay here. But even this thing about the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, I want to go into that because... Other brothers went into it. I'm like, man, I wish I was there. We're starting to see everything we, we learned in church and what's in these scrolls. So part of root, uprooting Christianity, we want to tear down every false image that the church gave us under this of uh, Christianity. So last week, we went over some history. It was a lot of reading. But one thing we brought out was that the Roman, the Roman Catholic Church really gave you Christianity. And the symbols that you come to, to know as being holy, the cross, the dove, 
and all this stuff, these are Babylonian uh, symbols. These symbols have nothing to do with Hamashiach. So today I want to, if I could, we brought out, you know, the, the heaven wooden phalluses around their necks. So now they, they traded in wooden phalluses. I think you got to redo your screen share. It's not sharing. So now, a man in a suit and tie, he's a businessman, he's a holy man. But the history shows that those neckties, they are really phalluses around your neck. They're really phalluses around your neck that they would wear and kiss for good luck when they're going to war. But now you got me thinking I'm, I'm dressing for Jesus in a necktie on. Or then, then my I'm a lot of brothers. Oh, y'all a little bit better. We ain't gonna wear the necktie. We're gonna wear the bow tie. That's still not the culture. You air wearing bow ties? It's 90 degrees over in Arabia. <laughs> Damn, ain't no real air wearing no bow ties. So we just been adopting these things, not asking questions, thinking we dressed to the nines. You ain't dressed to the nines. You dress like a European monkey. That's what you look like. <laughs> So we got to go through all this digging, trying to tear down uproot Christianity. Today, I want to go back into that little five-dollar word, textual criticism. I want to go into textual criticism and dissect this book that we call Bibles a little bit more. Because y'all remember that fancy word, three, three words they told us that Bible was? The seminary people, the Bible's what? Basic instruction before leaving earth. Well, that's not that one. Uh, what does seminary teach the people? Infallible. The Bible's what? Infallible. Get a mic, Bob. Infallible. Infallible. Inerrant? Inerrant? I can't remember the last one. Somebody help him out with the last one. I ain't never. <laughs> they teach that the Bible is. Inerrant, uh, infallible, and inspired. Inerrant means it's incapable of having errors. Mm -hmm. Infallible is pretty much the same thing, meaning you can't adulterate the word of God. Mm -hmm. And then inspired means the Holy Ghost gave us this book. Mm -hmm. Really, really. We're up to like 44 errors we all have been collecting on these last two years. I found one last week. I found one. or I, Somebody else found one. We have the 44 errors just in the so-called Old Testament. And these errors, because the seminary trained people, they're very slick. You got to watch them. You got to listen to them closely. They're going to say, yeah, we know about those, but those are minor errors. They don't change the context of the text. You're a liar. They do. They do change the text. So if these books that you call Bibles are an errant, infallible, inspired by who? By who? Because now we're learning there's multiple spirits. Every spirit can be a Holy Spirit. Holy just means set apart. So that spirit of lust, that's a Holy Spirit. Mm. Set apart by who? Mm. Hashatan. Mm. So just because you use the words holy, holy ghost, it is holy ghost. Satan has, whole, Satan has set apart spirits, set apart ghosts to attack you. That's what we see going on this whole week. Physically and spiritually, set apart ghosts are attacking you. Let me get these mics right. It just goes to show you why you're doing that, that we got to come back to the Hebrew and understand. Because Kodash, it tells you that, it, you, you know, you hear the word holy. We just It's all that entertainment, that feel-good doctrine. Oh, yeah. you hear the word holy, and your mind goes somewhere else. Just like when you hear the word reward. Don't turn that heat down. Like even when you hear that word reward, people think, oh, Christ is coming. Like when he say, I come quickly and my reward is with me. Mm -hmm. That he's going to give to every man according to their works. Mm -hmm. sure that law ain't done away with. But when people hear that word reward, they think, oh, we going up to heaven. Prize of money. <laughs> Little do they know the wicked are going to receive a reward and the righteous are going to receive a reward according to their word. According to your works. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
So somebody lied telling us these books called Bibles are inerrant, infallible, and inspired. These books are not inerrant. They're, they're full of errors. So y'all remember this, this, this friar. Let's read him real quick just to refresh. And this website is right, the, the link is right there, Preacher Institute. But this, here's a friar, I guess he's a super duper rabbi, Joseph Gleason. Can somebody read that for us? I used to believe the Masoretic text was a perfect copy of the original Old Testament. I used to believe that the Masoretic text was how God divinely preserved the Hebrew scriptures throughout the ages. I was wrong. The oldest copies of the Masoretic text only date back to the 10th century, nearly 1,000 years after the time of Christ. And these texts differ from the originals in many ways or in many specific ways. The Masoretic text is named after the Masoretes, who were scribes and Torah scholars who worked in the Middle East between the 7th and 11th centuries. The text that they received and the edits they provided ensured that the modern Jewish text would manifest a notable departure from the original Hebrew scriptures. A notable, a, no, it was a notable departure from the original Hebrew scriptures. If Uncle Masha and, and Joshua, Yahweh Shai was here, and you gave them that Masoretic copy, they wouldn't even be able to, they probably would smack you because you adulterated the Most High's word. That's how stern our elders were. You did what? You wrote the Father's name how? That's why sometimes... When I write the, my hand writing sloppy, but when I mess up the father's name, I just erase it, throw it away. That's the, that's how our elders held this. You did what to the scrolls? So you imagine reach, you wicked Israelites, you come up with a whole new language, dots and Nikrus and Elohim, and, and his name is Adonai, his name is Hashem. What did he show me book, chapter, and verse? He told you to call him Hashem. He said, call on me in the day of trouble. He didn't say call on the name. He said call on me. <laughs> Let this world know that the great I am, your how it delivered you from these enemies. He didn't tell you how Shem. Where's that in the book? These Masoretes gave you this, family. These Masoretes gave you this. So strike one, these wicked Israelites corrupted the text. Then we got this. This is a, a, a preface inside the... Um, inside the um, Apocrypha. If you got a copy of the Apocrypha, this is the intro to the book or the prologue to the book of Sirach or Ecclesiasticus. And the elders are telling you, they're being honest with you. They're saying, listen, we tried to copy this from the Greek, from the Hebrew into Greek, but he's, he gave us a warning when trying to copy things from the original Hebrew. Ah, can you read the warning? For the same things uttered in Hebrew and translated into another tongue have not the same force in them. And not only these things, but the law itself and the prophets and the rest of the books have no small difference when they are spoken in their own language. He says we did our best, but these other languages, to, to put in our vernacular, these other languages can't hang with us. So when, when you say to Christian, oh, I sin, I'm going to get right on Sunday. But when I tell you in the Hebrew, you kata, you kata, and those letters, those three letters means you separated yourself from the mark of the Most High Spirit. Don't that sound a little bit more? Oh, I sinned. God knew my heart. No, you just separated your, he came and talked to you right now. That's why we got to wash before we go into the temple. That's why he say, stay away from your wife when I'm coming down. You can't go, you got a, a, a pus coming out your rib. You can't go. That's why I tell people, I don't like people talking to me at the job because I'm, I'm praying, even though you don't see me praying like, like you done learned in church. I'm talking to Abba Yah. You coming over me, touching me, good morning. Like, yeah. I'm talking about Father right now. I don't know where your hand's been. You coming here with a pork sandwich from, from a boat, Jangles. Now I gotta say, Father, please follow you. Know, that's how serious this is. So now you done translated the Father's word into German, Latin, Russian, and it seems like a good thing, but you gotta be careful. 
You gotta be careful. You think you got something there? Pre oh, 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 you say he Daniel the lion's den. And when I couldn't pay my light bill, I was in the lion's den. That ain't what Daniel was talking about. Got nothing. You trying to make this thing relatable to everybody. These scrolls ain't, ain't supposed to be relatable to everybody. These things are food food for us, by us, family. <laughs> they come into the world for sake. <laughs> and then they want to put their grease in the hand. Good morning. That's how you can move. That's how you can move. I keep moving, man. So this is, can you see, can y'all see this? How's it looking? Not up there, but I can see it up here. So the website is there, family. For the sake of time, I don't want to be too long today. This is the website we brought out. And let's read the first sentence, Pop. Yet the fact is that until the last quarter of the 14th century, there was no prose version of the Bible in English in the English language. There was not. There was no prose version of the Bible in the English language. The fact is, not until the last quarter of the what 13th century, 14th century. So they're saying the um, 1500s. It would be the 1400. Always oh, subtract one. So it's saying the, okay. the 14th century. So you want to track, subtract one, 1375. Mm -hmm. They didn't have English, uh, uh, they didn't have the English language really written down. They were still making their language up in 1375. When was the first King James edition written? 1611. 1611. In history, 300 years is not a long time. Now, I'm going to show you with this book here in a couple of weeks, y'all willing, that the King James Version is the Johnny Come Lately. King James in 1611, he was the last one on the scene. He was the last one on the scene. They had English Bibles going back to the 14, 1500s. But this text is telling you they were just getting the language of English together in 1375. Our ancestors are ancient. So how you know what the word for sin is? We're ancient people. Oh, who's going to find a word that's close? Oh, you play you play word games with a holy text, but now you're here preaching. Holy Ghost show me the oh, Holy Ghost. This is textual criticism, family. Finish that up. Uh, Indeed, there was only coming to be an English language. It was gradually emerging, taking definite shape and form so that it could be distinguished from the earlier Norman, French, Saxon, and Anglo-Saxon in which so much of it is rooted. The year 1375, the English language was still being developed. Like Ebonics just popped up. That's what English was. English was like the last language to be developed. Now, the most popular copy of the Bible is in English. And you telling me this is holy writ. The Bible says, if I repent, I shall be saved. All who confess the name of Jesus Christ shall be saved. And there's not a character named Jesus Christ nowhere in Judea. So I got to correct myself. And I've been pushing that the Masoretic text is corrupt. And what I meant by that, I should have said, I should have distinguished what I meant. The Masoretic text was the Hebrew. It was those vowel points, changing the father's name from Yahweh to Adonai. That's the, but it's in Hebrew. They added those dots. So that he, I don't want to call it Hebrew. That that new language they made up. Yiddish. No, it was it's before the Yiddish. The Yiddish didn't come around until like. Um, well, because they, they started their work in like, some sources say they started in uh, like 700s trying to hear hustle because no one wanted to deal with them. The real, the, the real Nazarites, they're like, no, we're not giving you nothing we have. So they had to hear hustle and steal pages to write their book. So some sources says these Masoretics started their work in like 600, 700, and they didn't really get it finished to like 900, 900 or 1,000. But... The Masoretic original is in Hebrew. But like Shemur y'all read, these Masoretic priests, they admit that they receive corrupted text from their elders. So you got a corrupted text from your elder, strike one. Now you invent a language 
that's not holy because Moses can't read it. Strike two. Now fast forward to you and I generation. Now we're slaves speaking English. If this was a picture, the Bible you got in front of your family is based on a faulty Masoretic text and then it's held together with the English Bible. This would be your Bible, family. <laughs> How many of y'all, would you put Elijah in this house? This is what you got when you tell me, here's the key, I'm KJV only. Congratulations, you just got a little bit of adoration on them. You think I'm King James only, I'm Old Testament only. It's all garbage. That's why we gotta come back to this original language. That's why we gotta come back to this original language. So, y'all know how I talk about false doctrine. And people get offended, people make a big deal about it. But we're slaves, reading fragments of fragments, doing the best we can. And today, we have to expose somebody who's been teaching false doctrine. And I don't want you to get upset. I don't want y'all to get excited. It's just, it's the, that's what it is. Guess who's been teaching false doctrine? Probably going to say yourself. Yeah. I've been teaching false doctrine. And I'm not embarrassed about it. It don't mean less of a teacher. What it's going to do is going to be a teachable moment to show you how much we need this original language and how much you need Messiah. I got to put this disclaimer out there. This class is really, this whole series is really not for newbies. If you, if you just coming in or you're weak minded, oh no, I, the whole Bible is fake. This is not for you. That's not the purpose of this class. The purpose of this series is to show you how much you need to be fasting and praying. Abba, show me the truth. Hamashiach, come tell, is this the truth? Did you say this? So the purpose of this is not to get you to, to throw your Bible away or the New Testament, it's to get you to, to pray and strong, to fast more. I, I, need to, I need to know. I want to know why do you want to know. So I can be righteous in line with you and so I can help my brothers and sisters. So if you're weak-minded, this is not the series for you. This is not trying to get you to burn your Bible and it get you to say, oh, we can't believe nothing. No. He said in the last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon my people. And that's what you need. You got these rabbis. I wrote a book. I've been to the land. I don't care. Sure don't. The most high spirit ain't in that land. The most high spirit is not in the land of Israel right now, family. They over there have a rainbow parade, a parade or what? You think Abba Yah's there? You take a picture in front of mine, you man. You don't know what that is. They made that up in, in Constantine, Dad. Let's move on. So I've been teaching false doctrine, and it wasn't on purpose. It wasn't on design. It's, it was, I'm a slave, and I'm still learning my culture. I hope that don't sway you. I hope you don't. You know, lose respect for me. I don't know everything. Y'all see my hands. I'm not the master teacher. So this is a, a learning moment and to show you how much we need to come back to the original. The foul bread. The foul bread. Let's go to Genesis 36. Shamar y'all went into something last week and I was trying to cut him off on purpose. Because he was going into an old study that I came across a couple years ago, but I never finished it. For those of you just coming in and you really want to know the truth for yourself, I recommend that you get you a notebook, a binder, old school binder, and get organized by topics. Have a digital too, you know, digital is good too, it's convenient. But there's going to be some studies that you come across and you got to move on because you don't have enough witnesses and you just got their coming time. So I'm glad Shamor y'all brought out what he did because it helped me go finish this old topic that I came across a couple years ago. So we're going to open up with Barashat or Genesis. Barashat chapter 36 and just go to when it gets to Esau's genealogy. We're going to bring something out of here. Genesis 36. Nine. Is it 9? Generations of Esau. Come. Genesis 36, verse 9. Shema. Read. 
And these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in Mount Seir. Uh -huh. These are the names of Esau's sons, Eliphaz, the son of Adah, the wife of Esau, Reuel, the son of Bashemeth, the wife of Esau. And the sons of Eliphaz were Taman, Omar, Zepho, and Gatam, and Kanaz, and Temna was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bare to Eliphaz Amalek. These were the sons of Adah, Esau's wife. Uh -huh. And these are the sons of Reuel, Naha, and Zarah, and Shammah, and Mizah. These were the sons of Bashemeth, Esau's wife. And these were the sons of Aholibama, uh -huh. The daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, Esau's wife. You got a lot of wives, huh? And she bare to Esau, Jeush, and Jalam, and Korah. And who? Korah. So this is the start of Esau's line when he went away from his father, uh, Yatza Zachar, Isaac, and Rebekah. He went and took the women of Canaan to get back at mom and dad. Our father, Yaakov, whose name was changed to Israel, by the orders of his mother, by subtlety, stole Esau's birthright. And instead of Esau having a repentant heart, he says, okay, since you did me like that, I'm going to go break your heart, mom, and I'm going to marry Canaanite women. What man in here will intentionally break his mom's heart? The times you break your mom's heart, you feel like less than dirt. Like you would want to see your mom, like because you know you done did her wrong. That's honestly the way I look at it. That's not, that's breaking the commandment: honor your mother, mother and father. That's the way I look at it. So that shows you the spirit that Esau had put in him. We can't rag on him too much because remember, you got to keep things in context. You got to kick it. Abiyah says, "I chose one in the womb over the other." Mm -hmm. But just so you know, the spirit that y'all put in him. Okay, mom, you, you, you did me like that. You gave my hair to my little brother. Now I'm going to break your heart and go marry these Canaanites. The Canaanites are, are the descendants of who? What's Shem, Japheth, or Ham? Ham. Ham. So Esau went and married Hamites, right? Now, for the second time, let's jump over to Genesis 36 and pick it up at uh, 19. Shema. Yeah, Genesis 36. These are the sons of Esau, who is Edom, and these are their dukes. So this recorder, whoever's recording Genesis, they, they think it's pretty important that we know who Esau and his sons are. Because he keeps saying, this is Esau, who is Edom, and these are his dukes. They think this is pretty important, right? Read on. These are the sons of Seir, the Horite. Who? Seir, the Horite, uh -huh. who inhabited the land. Lotan and Shobal and Zibian and Anah. And Anah. So for some reason, the text goes from running down the, the lineage of Esau. Now it's running down the lineage of this man named Seir, and he's a Horite. And the research that's popular and what I came across, they tied that this, this Seir character is somehow goat people. Sierra is somehow a goat man. Let's go back to when we first see this name. Let's go back to Genesis, I think is uh, 15, when, when Abraham started to come out. I think the name is first mentioned in Genesis 15 and 14. Is it Genesis 15 and 14? That's what he that's when he had the no for a surety that I seem to be a stranger in a land that is not their own. It's when uh, the kings start conquering. It's 14. It's 14? Genesis 14, chapter 14. Come on, go back one chapter. Uh, let's go to Genesis 14 to see the first mention of this name. Genesis 14, and it's over at verse 6. Verse 6. 
the water of Bob. So this is 14 and 6. Read. And the Horites in their Mount Seir unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. So the kings, these kings are starting to war up, and Abraham is trying to get himself stable. And this is the first mention of these Horites who live on the mountain of Seir. And these theologians, these theologians, when you read these uh, lexicons, you have to bear in mind these people are pagans. If we were in church today, I would say, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't you know we behind enemy lines? Everything we're reading, we got to filter through the Hebrew. So this is a screenshot from Blue Letter Bible on the screen here. And let me go back to presentation mode. And can you see the word Sierra there? Can somebody read the, the definition of Sierra? It says he goat, a buck, a sacrificial animal. Uh, Seder may refer to a demon possessed goat like the swine of Gadar. So this lexicon is written by pagans, non-Israelites. They call themselves Hebraists. They, they, they call themselves, these people are always giving themselves titles. We don't know nothing about Hebraists, but these pagans feel I mastered the Hebrew language, so I'm a Hebraist. We're not even Hebrews, so how are you Hebraist? <laughs> so you got to filter everything. But they equated the, he, the word Sierra to to mean a he goat, a buck. B, definition B says a satyr may refer to a demon possessed goat. What does the, that, that clarification may means, may refer? That means they aren't really sure. They don't know. You can't have these textbooks in school, then we get to university now. I need stipends to buy this two hundred fifty dollar book. But people make an educated guess. Making ed many scholars believe, many scholars think. Theology, <laughs> theories, theories. Our family. When it comes to this history, the only historians we respect are prophets and Israelites. If a if a theologian is really a real thing, the only theologians we respect are from our ancestors. So. He says a satyr, and it may refer to a demon-possessed goat, like the swine of the Gadora. I want you to lock that in your mind. This pagan has taken the, the word, the English word seer, to mean goat, he goat, and a satyr. But for the sake of time, family, I'm just going to drop it on you. The Hebrew word that they're trying to, to, to translate is shar, shar. And it's two characters, two front teeth and the head of a man for Shar. That character in the middle is supposed to be an eye. They turn it into a vow. We don't need it. We don't need it. So the Hebrew word is Shar. And Shar has many usages. That's why you got to kick it. You got to keep it in context. But in this instance of Mount Sierra, it's not referring to a goat. It's referring to hairiness. Hairiness, because everything in Hebrew is concrete. So this mountain that the Horites live in is not a mountain of goats. It's talking about the terrain. The terrain is hairy or woody. It's woody. How do I know this? For the sake of time, if you if you use the blue letter Bible and type in the word goat, it's not Seir. It's not Seir. The Hebrew word for goat is Azah. Azah. So these pagans they took it upon themselves to conjecture that Mount Seir is a mountain of he goats. And then the Horites may, may be goat people. This is the doctrine they're pushing for undertone, for undertone. We won't get into that, but this is how they line stuff up, right? So when, when, when I, I said, let me get back to my notes and then I'm two computers down, so I'm like, I, I don't even know what computer was on. I'm losing drive. I'm telling y'all, y'all get y'all stuff in order because you don't want to be like me, like, oh, man, where's that drive at? Where's that notebook at? So I couldn't even find the, the, the original notes, right? So I said, I'm just going to take it from here, from the research, right? So 
They're saying Mount Sierra is a mountain of he goats, or these Horites may be goat people, right? And Seder, it, it could be used as a Seder or it may refer to a demon possessed goat, right? Let's do a quick little super research here. This is super, super heavy research right here, right? Can we read this up? A satyr in Greek mythology. In what? In Greek mythology. What does Greek mythology mean? The Greeks made it up. That means you have no receipts. You have no book, chapter, and verse. You have no sightings. This is Greek cartoons. Greek cartoons. That's what we're reading here. Read on. Uh, also known as Silenos or Silenos is a male nature spirit with ears and a tail resembling those of a horse as well as a permanent exaggerated erection. Well, I thought y'all calling this the goat mountain, but Greek mythology says he's like a horse. So which one is it, theologian? Which one is it, historian? Is this the goat mountain or is this the goat mountain of horses? They're making up stuff as they go along. And guess where it ended up at? In our Bibles. In our Bibles. Read on up. Early artistic representation sometimes included a horse-like legs, but by the 6th century BC, there were more often represented with human legs. Comically hideous, they have mane-like hair, bestial faces, and snub noses, and are known and are always known or shown mm -hmm. naked. Satyrs were characterized by their ribaldry and were known as lovers of wine, music, dancing, and women. They were companions of the god Dionysus and were believed to inhabit remote locales such as woodlands, mountains, and pastures. They often attempted to seduce or rape nymphs and mortal women alike usually with little success. They are sometimes shown playing with themselves or engaging in bestiality. This is all cartoons, family. They're making, this is Greek cartoons. For the second time, uh, drop down to the, the highlighted uh, underlying sentence there over. Over the course of Greek history, satyrs gradually became portrayed as a human, as more human and less bestial. You're, you're making up stuff as you go. You're making up stuff as you go and then it ended up in our Bibles. What did that research say about the English language? You were just getting it together in 1375, but now you're telling us that our uncle Esau went and got with these Horites, and these Horites may have been like goat people, and you see how, show me receipts. Show me receipts. That's why this plumb line is so powerful. No matter what this man, I, I, I taught at Yale, and yeah, I'm, okay, congratulations, you earned a paycheck. I still need receipts. Show me two or three witnesses that these are goat demons. So that's just one resource. You know we got to come with another one. This is from Edamont Online, and this is the etymology of the word Seder. Can somebody help us out? Seder, one type of a woodland deity, part human or animal, demigod or spirit of the air or woods, companion of Bacchus. Companion of who? Bacchus. Babylonian deity. This is, this is what y'all making up. Bacchus don't exist to us. We're looking at our ancestors. What are, you, what are you doing? Why are you on this line? You know, that's why we over here because y'all are doing this mess. Why are you on this line in a parade to Bacchus? This made up idol that these Canaanites have made with their hands. Y'all make your event, God. Y'all are great cartoonists. This is what this, this satyr animal is, family. Read on. From old French satire and directly from the Latin satyrinus, from Greek satros or sat, sat, satyros, a word of unknown origin. They don't know where it comes from. Read on. The etymology is unknown. A number of hypotheses have been proposed, but none of them make sense. None of them what? None of them make sense. They don't know where the word come from. But now you want to read a holy writ by my ancestors and say, oh, that's what this animal is. That's what this mountain is named after. Really? Really? They got, they got the nerve to mock and talk down on our way of speaking when it comes to our slang. 
when in reality, they whole language is just a whole bunch of made up nonsense. Made up gibberish. That 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 mumble rap. Bum 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 and I see satire, but I also see satire when I'm reading it in a different way. So I just looked up satire, and it's it's Roman. And and when we think of satire, you think of the genre of literature, or you think of the genre of how you instead of comedy, it might be satire or, or instead of romance. And it says the use of humor, irony, exaggeration, or ridicule to expose and criticize people's stupidity. And we they probably put that in there just to just to make make a mockery of us. Satire. We use satire when we talk about Christianity, but the Romans the Romans came and yeah they did, they did, they defeated the Greeks on one hand, but on on the other hand the Greeks really, really won because the Greeks spread their culture to the world. So the Romans y'all defeated me in war, but I got your mind. You're teaching your people Greek mythology. But you're just gonna put a Roman name on it, but it's really me. You, you just remixed it. So the Greeks are really running this world right now. The Greek Empire has not left. You're calling that world that that country Egypt because of the Greeks. That country name is not Egypt. What did our family call it? Matazarion. So the Greeks really won the war, even though the Romans in control of the beast right now. Uh, let's finish this up. In in pre-Roman. Greek are a man-like being with the tail and ears of a horse. The conception of being part man and part goat is due to the Roman sculptors who seem to have assimilated them to the fawns of native mythology. The conception of a being part man, part goat is due to Roman sculptors who seem to have assimilated them. you just making stuff up. These Roman, so there's no such thing as a satyr. There's no such thing as a man who looks like a goat family. This is, has entered our Bibles. This has entered our Bibles. Uh, let's drop down for the second time. We've got a lot to go through. Um, for the second time, in the Middle English. In the Middle English, the word could mean also a kind of ape supposed to live in Africa or Arabia. Now it's an ape. Now it's not a goat no more. But, but first it was a horse, but now it's a goat. Oh, now it's an eight too. Which one is it? And this word appears in our Bible. We don't uh, supposed to live in Africa or Arabia after the use of the Greek uh, satyros, and the name was later applied by zoologists to the Orangutan. Orangutan. Uh huh. You see how you can't pronounce their words? That, 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 that don't look like nothing like orangutan. Their language is bastard, family. So, for the second time, now they're applying the word to orangutans. Well, first it was a horse. Now, then it was it became a goat-like man. Then it became for apes. And now they're applying it to orangutans. Which one is it, theologian, historian? And how did it end up in my scroll if it's imaginary? How did it end up in our Holy Scroll family? You see, I got an arrow pointed by zoologists. You're calling your people zoologists. I guess you are an expert with animals. This is our ancestor. This is our ancestor. This is Solomon's son. We tame lions. So if you're a zoologist, what are we? <laughs> Me and Tina seen a, a story. I was laughing. I'm, I'm laughing. This, this, this zookeeper at the hours thought it would be a good idea to walk past this like tiger cage at the hours it's dark and pet the lot the tiger. Guess what the tiger did? <laughs> I'm like, who thinks that show you that these animals don't, don't like being in your zoo? They don't need you feeding them. God took the most high gave them an instant to get food. So you lock them up with tranquilizers so little kids can run around. And now if you're a grown man, it's nighttime. Y'all know who, who love animals at nighttime, what happens to their eyes? They go into hunting. <laughs> so, so this tiger, the sun sets, he switches his eyes to hunt mode. 
You put your hand in his cage, he see it as, a, as a, an enemy or fool, he latches on to this zookeeper's arm. He's screaming. This poor tiger gets shot in the head by the police because of this idiot. Our ancestors tamed these lions, but you a zoologist? What are we? What are we? Beast masters. <laughs> so, going into the foul bread, and I'm gonna show you how I was teaching false doctrine, and, and most people are still teaching false doctrine, but this false doctrine was not a malignant, this is out of ignorance because we're behind enemy lines. So this false doctrine that we all are teaching, most of us Israelites, is due to uh, defiled bread. So let's go to Deuteronomy 28 and show you how we got taught false doctrine. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Go back to Seder real quick. So now y'all see that it's, it's, it's a venom, right? Uh, take us to Isaiah 34 and 6. Let's bring this out. Take us to Isaiah 34 and 6. Now we know that history of a satyr being a made-up Greek uh, cartoon. How did it wind up in our holy text? Isaiah 34, verse 6. Shaman? Shaman. Read. The sword of Yahweh is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness. And with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidney, the rams, for Yahweh has been sacrificed in Basra. So what Yah is saying here, this is Edom's destruction. And what, what I was saying is, you Edomites, Uncle Esau, and, and cousins, big cuz, y'all had your run. And because of your wickedness and because of your, your, your uh, hatred against your own brother, now my animals are going to feast on you and your people. My animals are going to have a sacrifice. My animals are going to have a feast day off the Edomites. I just saw a, a video of a, a bull breaking into a shop and boarding a man. You getting ready? Yeah, I was like, <laughs> stop, let me stop. <laughs> but that's what Hebrew posted it. That's what they said. They said something similar to that. These animals are attacking y'all because it's a preview. It's a preview. So Isaiah 34, Abu Yah is telling Edom, Get ready for your destruction. My animals, I'm gonna feed my animals off of y'all's blood. Let's drop down to verse 14. Ah, uh. you want me to finish up verse six? Come for Yahweh has a sacrifice of Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Edom. Basra is the capital of Edom, that's where we know where the Edomites are. The Edomites are not uh non melanated people like this bro doctrine. I hate these. We ain't going to go into that level, but we know where Esau is. His capital is Basra. Go on a map and look it up. That's where Hamashiach is coming first to get busy. He's not even going to Rome first. Funny, huh? Funny, right? All this bro doctrine out here, all this camp doctrine. He's not even going to Rome first. He says, I'm going to Basra. All right, let's go. On. But their, you do, their ancestors did migrate, right, and right. mix with, okay, just uh, making sure. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Let's drop down to verse 14. Verse 14. The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island. So the, the, the beasts are about to have a party. The beasts are going to be happy, especially when they see us. Yeah, boy, we're about to fix and get ready to bring the Israelites back. You see that. You know, the wicked are, are ours for the taking. You see that in the book of Joshua, when Masha, when the Most High spoke to Masha through burning bush. He was walking into Matazariah to go speak with Pharaoh. The lions were leaping. Happy for the righteous people. Him. They were happy to see so, so we're going to have a feast day, and the animals are going to have a feast day. Read on. And the satyr shall cry to his fellow. The screech owl also shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. How did our ancestor use this word satyr? And satyr is a made-up Greek word. You see the foul bread we're going through? But in church tomorrow morning, they swear they read Holy Writ. We just showed you with receipts, Seder is an, a Greek invention. Anybody got a Septuagint out to match that word right there? Got to uh, read it from the Septuagint. It's not a Seder. It's not a Seder. He liked this good word. Amen. Uh, uh, Isaiah 34 and verse 14 the devil shall meet the 
with spectators, or and they shall cry one to another, and there shall spectators rest, having found for themselves a place of rest. Now, start, starting from the top, let me show you how cocky meaning that, that the Septuagint sounds too. Read this again from the top. The devil shall meet with satyrs, and they shall cry one to another. There shall satyrs rest, having found their themselves a place of rest. So the Septuagint even got it wrong, talking about the satyrs are going, the, the devils are going to cry to the satyrs, and the satyrs are going to have a place of rest. How can the satyrs have a place of rest when they are an invention of the Greeks? And why would the Most High reward the devil with a feast with his other animals? You see how you got to kick it? This is all out of context. Even the Septuagint missed it. Greek invention, a satyr does not exist. This Isaiah 34, Yah is giving his animals a, a feast day on the wicked Edomites and the other ones who were confederate against us. So you're telling me the most high is going to reward Satan with a feast day? You see how you got to kick it, family? Defile bread. Defile bread. Oh, man. Who does this? Is? I, I didn't want to go this deep. I got to be obedient. So another thing is the whore rights. The whore rights. This is why we learn our language, because the pagans turned them into whore rights. But when you look that word up in the blue lexicon, they're not whore rights. They're karyam. There are, they are Korya, the sons of Kar, the sons of Kar. They are the sons of Kar. They are Koryam. The, the, the Canaanites language closely matches the Hebrew. Because remember at the Tower of Babel, Yah confounded the languages, but for some reason the Canaanites reserved the language that was close to the Shemayim. Their language didn't get totally butchered like the other nations. So when Yah gave the language back to Abraham, it closely resembled the Canaanites, and that's why they tell us that we speak the Phoenician. No, we don't. The Phoenician was able to hold on to a remnant of the Holy Tongue, but it was restored exactly back to Abraham. So being close to the Holy Tongue is not the Holy Tongue. Almost doesn't count. Almost is only good at hand grenades and horseshoes. So the Canaanite language is sim similar to ours, but it's not holy because the Holy Tongue was restored to Abraham. Now, to show you that the Koryam are the Horites, and the Horites are not goat people, let's go to um, let's go to Jasher. We'll show you who, who Esau gave his daughters to. We're going to Jasher chapter thirty. Esau didn't give his daughters to goat people. We're behind enemy lines, people. Yeah, I must say, what I was saying, I didn't get to finish what I was saying, and I didn't want to talk about it because I'd rather go do the study, which that's what I'm doing. But they're from not you, what you're saying is still right because it is people that say that. But mm -hmm. it's talk like, what about like the ones where they're saying that they're uh, similar to the Neanderthal? Because, you know, they were saying, well, you know about that. And then you know that Asians and European whites have the Neanderthal gene according to their science. So how you, where do you feel like that? I, I can't really, I don't really respect their science because we're finding out now, y'all making up stuff up on the fly. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't, I don't so put do stuff in the believe, DNA. Do you believe in the Neanderthal existed? <laughs> I've seen the research and again, it's like, if our ancestors didn't talk about it to me, I, I gotta, I gotta, I need receipts. Okay. So what, how you feel about Jubilees, um, where it says that, that the watchers against the law of their ordinances went a whoring after the daughters of men and took the wives of all that they chose. And they made a beginning of uncleanliness and they begat the sons of the, the Nepalum and they were all unlike and they devour one another and then the giant slew the nephil and the nephil slew the ejo and the ejo or the eljo mankind and it continues to go on and i don't have it all here but what i'm saying is you know how it says there was giants in those days and then and afterwards yeah so like where eventually that seed with that seed with that seed where did that seed go 
if if someone can't give you exact receipts, you're just conjecturing. You're just conject because Napalm just means the fallen ones. So as in the fall as, as the fallen ones, the angels are having children, they're naming their children after that angel. So just because it says now it gives a new breed, like uh, what, what's that word? Each of each of totes? Eldro. Eldro. That don't mean it's a Neanderthal. That could be after one of the angels, because they're 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 mimicking us, naming their sons how how well I would name them. So that's not a, a, a receipt that these are Neanderthals. That's why these brothers, I don't knock no brother, everybody's doing their work, but this this DNA, it's their science. All they gotta do is change and say, oh, we got it wrong. It, this marker is not a genetic. That's why we stick to what? Prophecy. I don't need your science. So when they come up with these, when these theologians and his, historians come up with these, these, this great research, why did none of our elders get this research? They were getting it from the most high. And none of our elders talk about a Neanderthal. Then y'all are guessing how old the earth is. Oh, it's 30 billion years old. Oh, it's 100 billion years old. You don't, you don't even know. Because the most high told Adam, Adam, your son's got to get out the garden for 5,000 years. So now I got a text that my, my, my father says we got to leave the garden for 5,000 years, but you're telling me the earth is 30 billion. And see the stratosphere here? When we go into the earth and we, we break the level down of fossils, I can't trust nothing. Y'all say all your science is garbage to us. It's garbage. That's how much study we gotta go and, and reject their, their so-called information. So I'm gonna show you with text who these whore rights really are. Why is this not? Oh, it's locked it. So we're going to the book of Jasher, chapter 30. To show you that these whore rights are not goat people like, like this. This, this it's, it's been out there for a while. It's not, it's not new. And, and, the, and to, be, to be fair, this, this, this wasn't even spread by so-called black people. These, these were uh, Europeans spreading this mess that Esau uh, married these Horites who were goat people. Uh, so you can't trust, we behind enemy lines. If my, if my answers didn't say it, where are you getting it from? Now, y'all know how this site is. This site is hard to read for some reason, don't have read mode, but we still want to make it work. Just to show you what happened with Esau and the Horites, right? And it's at the end here. Let me find another jack that I like. I've got read mode. I'm going to find one with read mode on here. So how you feel about the um, the Minotaur or the Centaur? Uh, again, something an animal an animal like that is mentioned in Jasher, so I can give that credence because no, I don't accept everything in these pseudepigraphers. But at least I see the, the at least I see that mentioned in Jasher. Now again, just like we did Seder, we got to do Centaur like that or mentor like that. Is that a made up Greek word? Because where's the original of Jasher? The original of Jasher was in Hebrew. So just like we just did Seder, we gotta do mentor, centaur, just like that. Is that one of y'all made up Greek uh, Greek animals or not? Uh, I'm sorry, family, I should have had all this ready. This came last minute. I just wanna find a, a site that y'all can see. I'll just try this one. I'm gonna show you who the Horvites were and they were not goat people. So I don't think it's got read mode, but And this is why I respect these so-called lost rights. It's the same site. All right. For the sake of time, y'all can pull up Jash for yourself. And let's go to the, the very last.
the very last, these right here. Can y'all see that on your screen? They can't, they can't see it. They can't see that. Um, All right, bear with me, family. Let me, let me do this. Let me drop this. Hallelujah. We got it, y'all. We got it. We got it. We got it. Hallelujah. So we're going to Jasher 30 to show you who these Horites were. They're really Karyam. And we're going to show you who they descend from. They're not goat people. Esau didn't marry goat people because uh, they became satyrs. This is all a conjecture from these pagans. And that's why they should stay out of our scrolls. That's the whole purpose of doing, doing all this, showing you that these pagans should stay out of our scrolls trying to uh, match their pagan words with Hebrew words. So I guess because Shi'ar is close to their Sator, I guess they just match the letters up and say, hey, this is Sator. It's not. Let's go to the end of Jasher 30, y'all. And uh, can you start it at 26? Well, you start at 25 so y'all get the context. This is Jasher 30, verse 25. Is it showing well? Read. And a holy bomber conceived and bare to Esau three sons, Yehush, Yalan, and Korah. Uh -huh. And in those days in the land of Canaan, there was a quarrel between the herdsmen of Esau and the herdsmen of the inhabitants of the land of Canaan. Of the Canaanites or the inhabitants of the land? The inhabitants of the land of Canaan. Every word counts when you're reading, family, because you would get some of these Hebrew, mighty Hebrew teachers and say, see, no, slow down. And, and, and I'm, just, I'm, in, I'm in war mode. So if I offend someone, I'm, I'm on social media all the time. But you get these fly by night teachers who probably had to drop out and went to night school because you, now, now you're some teacher, now you're speaking Hebrew. Now you're running people astray. Got this captain doctrine out here. Time out. If you don't know, you don't know. Stop making up stuff or repeating stuff you don't heard if you ain't researched it yourself. You're causing more division than good, writing books and charging people for classes. Bunch of devils out here. So what we can see without making up, Esau is having a problem with the inhabitants of the land of Canaan. At this time of world history, family, Canaan is like America. It's the land of good and plenty. The Canaanites are ruling. So it don't mean he's having problems with Canaanites. He's having problems with inhabitants in the land of Canaan. Just like when there was a famine and everybody was in Egypt with us, it was more than Egyptians and Hebrews in Egypt. Everybody was in Egypt. So let's read this again, verse 27. Uh, verse 26. 26, uh -huh. And in those days in the land of Canaan, there was a quarrel between the herdsmen of Esau and the herdsmen of the inhabitants of the land of Canaan. Uh -huh. For Esau's cattle and goods were too abundant for him to remain in the land of Canaan. Mm -hmm. In his father's house, and the land of Canaan could not bear him on account of his cattle. Twenty-seven. And when Esau saw this, that his quarreling increased with the inhabitants of the land of Canaan, he rose up and took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all belonging to him, and the cattle which he possessed, and all his property that he had acquired in the land of Canaan. And he went away from the inhabitants of the land to the land of Seir. So only thing we can say definitely about the text and so inside the KJV and Jasher is Esau is having problems with people living in the land of Canaan. Now, if you get an old map at this time, Nimrod is the king. So the land of Canaan is all the land. Nimrod took the whole land from, from the Garden of Eden all the, all the way to the Euphrates, that's, that's Canaan now, because Nimrod is the king. 
So you just can't read the text and see he having problems with the, with the Sierra and their goats. You, the, the Mr. Historian, I know you got a PhD. I need receipts. Because I mean that that that's a good point. Just because when you read this, it tells you right there that Esau, who was an Ibar, was in the land of Canaan. So does that mean he's a Canaanite? No. Exactly. Does it mean we're Americans? No. We are Yashar Allah in the land of America. And you get these brothers puffing up with a bunch of shades on inside a building. Why you got shades on inside a building? Like, is your lights that hot? Then you got these historians, they, 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 they got a nice little shirt and tie on, and they put his title down here, Professor of, 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 of uh, Asiatic Studies. Oh, so now I respect you because you got a master's degree. Nothing you say is making sense. So Esau goes to the land of Shar, and Shar means hairy. One, one context, it can mean hairy. One context, it can mean, it can mean leaven, because that's our word for leaven, which is a metaphor for sin. But this text don't give you any indication of what these people look like in the land of Sierra. So if you conjecture what they look like, that's what it is. It's your self-made doctrine of what these people look like, because no text tell you what these people look like. You have to be fair, Mr. Historian. You have to be fair, doctor. You got to be fair. No text tell you what these Horites look like, but I'm going to tell you what line they come from. Read on. And Esau and all belonging to him dwelt in the land of Seir. Mm -hmm. But from time to time, Esau would go and see his father and mother in the land of Canaan. Stop. So he done married these wicked demon goats, but Abraham's going to let him come to his house? I mean, Isaac, Yatazah? Yatazah is going to let him come and kiss his mom? Jacob. Or Jacob? No, no, this is Esau. Jacob. Yeah, you're right. So their mom is Rebecca, yeah. right? Y'all y'all double check me, right? Isaac and Rebecca. Their mom is Isaac and Rebecca. So Esau then intermingle with these goat people, but he's going back home to see Isaac and Rebecca. It ain't adding up. It ain't adding up. Read on. And Esau intermarried with the Horites, and he gave his daughters to the sons of Seir mm -hmm. and the Horites. So look this up in the Blue Letter Bible, the Horite. I don't know why these pagans turned our cows into ancients. I guess they seen the picture of the fence there, the cob, and they just turned it into an H. These are really the Karyam, the Karyam, the sons of Shar is the, is the father of the Karyam, right? Now let's show you who these Karyams are, right? Verse 29. And he gave his elder daughter, Marzith, to Anna, uh -huh. his son of Zebian, his wife's brother. His wife's who? Brother. He gave his eldest daughter to his wife's brother. Who did Esau take to be his two wives? What land were they from? Who? Canaan. Say it with your chest. Canaan. So Esau took two wives from Canaan. Now he's giving his daughter to his wife's brother. So his wife's brother is what? A Canaanite. A Canaanite. That's what you can touch with the text. That's how you got to hold these people's feet to the fire. They make these great Great presentations on their screens and, and transitions, and then make, make up all kind of new creatures. And now they got the AI and stuff, and it's, it's, it's pretty. Show me receipts. Show me receipts. So I'm glad I brought that out because I never finished this study. So, and he gave his daughters, his eldest daughter, Marzah, to Anna, the son of Zaban, his wife's brother. His wife's brother is a Canaanite. So these Horites are Karyam and they're Hamites. That's what you can touch with the text. That's how you got to make these people be honest. That's how you got to make these people be honest, family. Yeah. That's why the Lord said, curse be Canaan. Curse be Canaan. You got to get stabbed out. So all the Edomites and all the Canaanites are going to be destroyed when Hamashiach returns. But this whole theory that these uh, Horites or goat people it's conjecture, it's made up, family. And that's how you gotta hold people's feet to the fire. That's how you gotta be a Berean and do the research, family. So I'm glad that happened. That was the perfect, that 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 interjection was a perfect segue to today's class, being a Berean and textual criticism. So this whole thing about putting that animal Seder inside our text, you're way off. No Israelite, no righteous Israelite would even mention that hideous imaginary. The creature of the Greeks.
Did so, you find anywhere where a uh, Holly Bama uh, came from? I didn't. I didn't okay. go that deep. Okay. I didn't go that deep. Again. But now she was, according to this, she was already in Sierra when he went there. So what does that what does that tell us? That, does that give us any more information? Not necessarily. No, it don't. That's right. why I say we don't know. It don't, it don't. We don't know where. Right. That, that's what I'm saying. These historians coming up with this conjecture. Show me your receipts where you can run this back that these Horites mixed with the fallen angels and these goat people. You, yeah. you just can't do you can't do that. And now people, you know, you put a shirt and tie on, and anything people see on YouTube is gospel. My teacher said, my more race said, just give me the book. Show me your receipts. So it shouldn't be offensive if someone could show you, hey, you really got that wrong. If you get offended, it's because you're in this for pride and clout and glory. And then these are the teachers I want exposed. Charge at nine ninety nine for your weekly class and monthly, and show me. So let's move on, family. Textual criticism. Let me show you how I was teaching false doctrine, and it was by accident because I'm a slave. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter twenty eight. Deuteronomy chapter twenty eight. You shouldn't be embarrassed about teaching false doctrine. Anything you got wrong, we we, we we're just waking up, family. We read a text for Passover that our own ancestors who spoke who spoke the original Hebrew, they forgot how to do tabernacles and all that stuff, and they were in the land. So why are you offended or embarrassed when you're waking up in 2015, 2016, and, and you get stuff wrong? I still hear elders. I, I was listening to one the other day. You know, he, he's my elder. It's good to be before you on the Lord's Sabbath. I'm like, yeah, it is the Lord's Sabbath. It's Baal's Sabbath. That's why all these people, you don't need the Hebrew language. They, they speak what they don't know what they're speaking about. That's why your breakdown's a little off. We definitely need that language. Mm. This is the Lord's Sabbath. If your elder hasn't come to an understanding of who Jesus is, that's a sign to me that you, the Ruach is not really with you. Great breakdown. I, I learned some facts. But if you still call on Jesus, the spirit of Hamashiach is not with you. That's just the facts of the case. It may be tight, but it's right. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 68. Hope y'all sitting down. Shema. Shema. Yes, both. Uh, the, the KJV first. All right, KJV. Shema. Read. And Yahweh shall bring thee into Egypt on the Kavarayim again with ships. By the way whereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again, and there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bond men and bond women, and no man shall buy you. Now, if those online, if you don't have a Septuagint, your Deuteronomy chapter 28 just stopped. Just stopped. But if you get a Septuagint, it's another verse there. Uh, can you read Deuteronomy 28, verse 69 out of the Septuagint? Uh, well, in mind, the phone in Greek. Let me get it for the people online when I have one. Which Septuagint are you reading from? Uh, I think they both read the same. I, I checked a couple online. Is it that one? Shamar, yours got 69 right there? No. Yours don't have 69? No. The Lexian don't have it? It says, and you shall be sold there to your enemies for servant, servants and female slaves, and there shall be no purchaser in this one. And then I will go to the one online. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, see, that's why yeah, the, I, sometimes I, the old stuff just works better, man. Like, I didn't, I thought the, uh, that's what I do. I go to the one, um, the one that's pretty much the Britain is online. So this tool here, I'm not sure if y'all knew about this. This tool is very valuable. You would download the audio files and uh, you know, cut if you're doing a presentation like Shamaria started, you can download the audio and put the audio into your uh, presentation. And it also, let me go to do the right between show you this tool. Uh, these years are rolling, you forget what you come across over the years, but uh, so do the right 28, right? Let me go back to regular mode. And you go down here, scroll to the bottom of the screen. And hit the parallel view. Where's parallel tool? 
Yeah, right here, I got it. It says, just while you're getting there, but it says, these are the words of the covenant which Yahweh commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, besides the covenant which he made with them in Korah. That's, that's 29 and verse 1 of my book. Yeah. The wife, you know, yeah. find stuff. Yeah. 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 But that's why, that's why I said, like, for me personally, I use this, but I'll go and check this site because it seemed to be the most. I thought this was exactly like the Britain, but maybe. See, that's this. We just got to go through so much. You go, they, 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 we're behind enemy lines, fam. That's why it's like in all this pride for you because you know your your feast calendar is off, and you like it shouldn't be like. Teach me if I'm if you think I'm off. Teach me. It shouldn't be this prideful. We're behind enemy lines. But this site has a, a, a parallel mode. It's like, I just had it up. That's why I tell, I've been saying for the past couple of weeks, there should be a foundational common ground that we all have. We the Israelites, we got to keep the commandments for the testimony of Yahweh Shai. You know, we get second next to the side of here. Oh, here we go. But after that. I'm sorry, y'all. So when you go to this site, on to the to the right, the Bible options, hit parallel view, and you're gonna let me do this first. Let me go here. For those online, I want you to see what he just read. He's gonna read it again so you know we're not making stuff up. All right. Click on parallel view, and it's gonna give you. I guess I've got to take it out of read mode. So I need it out of read mode. So you can't click on read mode, family. So it's right here in the Hebrew, but you see verse 69? Yep. This is Deuteronomy 28, 69 in the Hebrew, and you can pull it up on a, just copy and paste this, copy and paste this, and put it on a new tab, and it, it'll tell you, you can bring it up. He's gonna read it again. So you, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna make a point here about this uh, this verse, how some history got lost. Yeah, all the KJV and all the other ones, they just put this in chapter 29. Yeah. Just the top of 29. Yeah. They put it in 29.1? 29 29.1. 29 yeah, KJV did, and Lexham, and, and the Greek. So read it, read it again in the English. I'm gonna show you this verse. Deuteronomy 28 and 69. You want to read that in the KJV or in the uh in the um Septuagint. Deuteronomy 28, verse 68 in the Greek Septuagint. And the Lord shall bring you back to Egypt in ships by the way of which I said. You shall not see it again, and you shall be sold there to your enemies for bond men and bond women, and none shall buy you. None shall buy you. Verse uh, 69. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, beside the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. So Uncle Masha is about to die. And the older text did right by putting verse 69 with, six, with Deuteronomy 28 because it's the end of the contract. Yeah, it makes more sense. It makes more sense. Uh -huh. For them to put it, for, for no publishers to put it in the next chapter, that's why we're off. That's why you're missing stuff. So he says, this is the covenant that he made in the land of Moab. Who are they trying to say is a Moabitess? You see why this exposes that doctrine? Ruth is not a Moabitess. We've had the land since Uncle Masha was alive. And that, that one, they just didn't change the land, the name. They didn't change the name of it. Now, my Bereans, real quick, because we're getting off, off point is how we do. What was the commandment that Yah says when you come in, in contact with these Canaanites? To do what? Do not... Don't make... Don't make... Don't make... Don't kill them. And what? Stay with your chest. Kill them. Kill them. What's the chances that Uncle Masha is not going to listen? 
What's the chances that Uncle Marsh is gonna like, I'm tired and getting old, y'all gonna let these more bites, y'all gonna just y'all gonna listen to the Torah, y'all gonna circumcise your sons? Nah. Yeah, Moses, okay, y'all can stay alive. Nah, one time, Marsha once. Uncle Marsha, Moses had one sin, and it's because of y'all Israelites. <laughs> <laughs> so Uncle Marsha, Moses, when the most high says kill all these Canaanites, Moabites too, Ruth is not a Moabitess. How else we just didn't change the name? So this is Uncle Masha's generation. Ruth comes down with Obed and them. So she's not a Moabitess. She's an Israelite from the Northern Kingdom family. That's why this information is valuable. But to go back to the presentation, let me show you. She just was born there. She was born in the land of Moab. So this is the verse that apologists come against. So y'all, all y'all all think that all y'all, all because y'all black and because spaceship, y'all think Deuteronomy is talking about y'all and y'all the Israelite. This, this all you got? But Shamar y'all said it. If the Most High said it, that's all we need. I, that's all we need. Can I read this? This is what we need. Twenty-nine and now in Horeb, where the, is that where the king? Where, Commandments, or is that Sinai? Or ah, we got a Berean in the house. We got a Berean in the house. Go ahead. The reason I ask that is because a lot of people will try to say, you know, they 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 get fixated on the Ten Commandments, but we know man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So uh -huh. this is why words are important. And uh, it's, it's in both versions, but I'm just going to read it again. These are the words of the covenant which Yahweh commanded Masha to make with the children of Yasha all in the land of Moab. And that word besides the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. So, you know, I, I, I just saw that and that's what made me want to ask the question. Because obviously in Horeb there was a commandment given. But it shows you that there were other commandments given beside that original commandment. So um, I got some light notes, but this is another thing that, that's been lost in translation. When you go back and read it, the first time we come, we came to the wilderness of Sinai. But it was at the base of the mountain of Hor or Karab. But these again, that's how deep we're going. I, I got the know, I got the research. These theologians started interchanging Sinai with Horeb. So like, which one is it? And it's like, well, you see us coming to the wilderness of Sinai, and the mountain is there. So you know how over time, oh, that's the mountain of Sinai. But originally, it's really the mountain of Horeb or Karai. When, when they say what I learned when I was when working on the like the. the the end time stuff it's kind of an example up here but when they when they say when the wilderness of sinai like right there sinai wilderness it just means the terrain of the area right like it's this the the wilderness or the sometimes it'll say like the plains that just mean the countryside right. so that's what it was describing when it was saying the wilderness of but, sinai but that mountain really was horrible corral and that's what these texts, these theologians be arguing over. That's why you get these new additions. And this, this one theologian, a pagan, like y'all are arguing, it don't have nothing to do with you. But it's, it's like he came there and gave them uh, the 10, and gave them, okay, so this is the covenant. This is the basis that we are gonna establish. Then when they kept moving on, as they started getting to some of the land that they were promised, now he went over the rest of it. Well, what, ha what happened when the first generation died? What did you have to do to the new generation? Well, he had to be circumcised. Yeah, right. circumcised. Yeah. So he had to do everything he, over. He had to teach that new generation. That makes sense. So guys, you see how, so they, they the, the theologians they argue, was it Mount Sinai, was it Mount Hor? You got to understand our history, it ain't for you, but so that new generation, they had to get it again and they had moved now. So that's why you get these different locations. That's a great Berean eye, though. So, uh, is that all you have? Um, yes, that's it. All right, so 
The theologians, they on their YouTube channels having five and six hour debates talking about this, this is all y'all run to, Deuteronomy 28 68. Well, family, that little picture right there, you can go to a website called slavevoyages.org and they still have the manifest. And the manifest are being collected. This whole project is being collected by pagans, not us, not us. And they're telling you, they're collecting the registers from, from these slave ships and they're telling you the names of these people. And it's funny that you're telling us we're not the Israelites, but there's only one group of people on the planet ever had their had Yah in their name. And these people on these slave benefits have Yah in their name, either at the beginning or at the end. But it's just a coincidence, I guess. <laughs> so you can go to this website and check it out for yourself. But I allude, I alluded to it earlier why I don't I don't subscribe to the DNA, and it's not a knock to anybody who do. But when you want to say all y'all run to is Deuteronomy 28. Uh, let's back up to Deuteronomy 28 and verse 46. And verse 46. Love this one. And expound on that when y'all get there. Okay. <clears throat> you want me to read it out of. So you want me to. Remember, I'm going to back up and read 45, uh, just so we have context. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon you and shall pursue or chase you and overtake you till you be destroyed, because you hearken this not unto the voice of Yahweh, <laughs> your power, to keep his commandments and his statutes, which he commanded you. And they, referring to the curses, shall be upon you for a sign and for a wonder and upon thy seed forever. So when it comes down to identifying the people, according to this text, it's based upon looking at a people group and noticing these curses during the diaspora of Tom to notify who they are. So when you see a people who's always at the bottom, who's always being afflicted, who's always looked down upon by every other people group and nation, a people who's constantly being oppressed, a, a people who've been uprooted from their heritage, from their language, from their history, taken to the four corners of the earth and they're always called bywords and, and, and all of these different things, literally, that's how you identify who the children of Israel are. Y'all ever notice in Hollywood, they'll call us everything else but the children of God. They'll call us niggas. They'll call us coons. They'll call us African Americans. They'll call us Islamic. They'll call us Kemet. They'll call us Christians. They'll call us everything else but Yashar Allah. Whenever it comes to that, they have another nationality depicted. So they essentially they don't call us by our father's name. Absolutely not. Uh, anybody else have anything about that verse? Because Deuteronomy 28 and 46 says these curses are going to be a sign that I have marked y'all. So these apologists go on their little YouTube channels and they have all these check up Johnnies come on there and pseudo teachers. Y'all not the Israelites just because y'all went into slavery. Many people went into slavery. All nations was going into slavery. All nations were going into slavery. Family, any business people in here, entrepreneurs? What is a sign supposed to do for your business? Attention. Bring attention. Bring attention. So you are in business. Since you're aspirations, we, we got to go into it. But let's say your aspirations are up and running, right? You hang what they call your shingle. You hang your shingle out. Your sign. And your sign is supposed to draw attention. Are you going to make your sign just like your competitions? They have McDonald's. We have McDowell's. <laughs> <laughs> what 
What sense do that make? I would, you call my father a schizophrenic. You think you puffed up with all this book knowledge, pseudoscientists and pseudo researchers come on your YouTube channel talking about everybody went into slavery. Abba Yazid said, this is going to be a sign I put upon you. So my father is so, so backwards thinking, he going to put a sign that everybody goes through. You see how dumb you sound on your channel? You see how, you call the most high a liar. This sign is for his people. So if somebody went into a little slavery, yeah, the Arabs had, but what people was put on a boat, a boat for years. And the other people, did you rape and murder them and burn them alive? Did you put them in trees? Did you eat them? Did you eat them? Did you make chairs out of their hair? Did you put a cat inside a mother's womb for the cat to kill her? You don't tell me everybody went to slavery. And we still here. And we still here. The other people get reparations. Can I read this in the Septuagint? Go ahead, I'm going to read verses 45 and 46 again in Deuteronomy 28. But listen to how 46 sounds and just how important words are. Verse 45, and all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and shall overtake thee until he shall have consumed thee. Who's he? Until who? <laughs> until he has consumed thee. Until he shall have consumed thee. Now, who is he? The Most High is telling you I'm doing this. So you other nations, yes, slavery was a, a, a tool, but this sign that we went through no other nation can claim this happened to them. So when your apologist is going on his channel for four or five hours, having every Jack Johnny Buck come on, yeah, come on, come on, say something. What you got to say about this? Is black people in Israel right today went to slavery? No, no, man. Look at in Africa, they was in they was enslaving people ever since mankind. You're calling our father a liar because he said, I'm gonna put a sign on you. So if everybody went through slavery. He put he put a sign on everybody. The master planner of the universe put a sign on everybody. And until he shall have destroyed thee, because thou didst not listen to the voice of Yahweh, your power to keep his commandments and his ordinances, which he has commanded thee. And here's 46. And these things shall be signs in thee. Not DNA, not my blood, not my eye color, not the shape of my head. I'm not throwing rocks at anybody doing work. Do what you do. I'm just telling you, I'm sticking to prophecy. I don't care about the shape of my head, the shape of my nose. I've been told I got European lips because I don't have protruding lips. What is that? That's how you gonna identify me? By my lips? No, by the prophecies. My mom and dad didn't stay together. My grandparents barely stayed together. I don't know who my great grandparents are. I, death. Oh, you know you come from 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 your from from uh Judea back to the nine hundreds, Mr. Kazar. You you my great grandfather's talk to her and my great. Oh, so you know your lineage. You just told him yourself, Kazar. You don't fit the curse. Everybody, we just that's what I was saying earlier. Like no matter how many times we test it. Nobody can go more than two to three generations, generations back. back. I watched this one debate, one Israelite against this Khazar. He's a he's a so-called uh, uh, Syrian Jew. Can you can you read it in Hebrew for me? Can you read it in Hebrew? Like you can't read it in Hebrew. What a Yiddish you talking about? Anyway, let's get back on. And, so uh, just just finishing verse forty six. And these things shall be signs in thee and wonders among thy seed forever. Because thou didst not serve Yahweh your power with gladness and a good heart because of the abundance of all things. So, family, the slave ships, us getting uh, high interest rates, you done went and got two college degrees and you still can't get a house. This is the signs. Oh, let's flee Babylon. Let's, let's, let's flee Corona. Let's go to South Africa. Let's go to West Africa. If you was reading, Papa says, this, it don't matter where you go, genius. These curses are going to run you down. So you can go to Antarctica if you want to. The most high, if you, if you as people, he's marking you by these curses. So let me show you how I've been teaching false doctrine. And it's just the facts of the cases. It's not, it's 
not be embarrassed about. According to this text, it says, no man shall buy you. And the Septuagint is saying it too. No man shall buy you. And you got these so-called seminary trained theologians, or whatever they call themselves, pastors, apologists, they say, well, see, the text says that no man shall buy you. And y'all got bought. So this can't be talking about y'all. It's like, what kind of cockamamie doctrine is that? And the way I've been teaching it is that this is this no man shall buy you phrase. I've been teaching that this refers to the law of redemption. And let's show the people who knew. Let's go to what's Leviticus is it 32, the law of redemption. Where you can redeem one of your brothers out of um, slavery. If one of your brothers fall into hard times, you can go redeem him out of slavery. And that's what we've been teaching. That's what I've been, I'm going to speak for Abaya. That's what I've been teaching that when Deuteronomy 28 and 68 says, No man shall buy you, it's saying that no man shall redeem you from the curses of slavery. That's what I've been teaching, but it's false doctrine. Um, and again, I left my notes at work. Let me see if I have to be here. I pray one day I have a secretary to keep me in order. I claim it. But no. Is it, I think that's it. Is it 25? It started talking about redeem. Yeah, because in 25, 25. Yep, yep. Just drop my memory. Hallelujah. We're going to Leviticus 25, uh, and I'm going to show you the law of redemption. And this is what I, this is what I thought this verse was talking about, but I was wrong. Thank you. Uh, so I've been teaching over the years that Deuteronomy 28, 68 is saying no man shall buy you, meaning that no man can come redeem you out of slavery because we do have a redemption law. I, where does it start? Let me see. 24. 24. Yes, yeah, Let's go back. Yeah, calm, calm. So Read this on your own time. We can't sell our land and we can't we can't let our brothers serve a stranger. That's the law of redemption. The, the most high tell us here that the land belongs to me. I just gave it to you for the inheritance, but you're my servant, but the land is mine, so you can't sell the land. Me, if me, if me and my brother fall in hard times, I can sell it to an Israelite while I get back on my feet to keep a, a, a pagan from getting it. We can't sell our land to strangers, right? Pick it up at Leviticus 25 and 24. Uh, Shema. Shema. Shema, read. And in all the land of your possession, you shall grant a redemption for the land. Uh -huh. If your brother be waxen poor and have sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. So see, your brother sold it, he fell in hard times, but so another brother can come redeem the land back to keep it in your tribe. All our land is supposed to stay in our tribes. Read on. Verse 26, and if the man have none to redeem it and himself be able to redeem it, then let him count the years of the sale thereof and restore the overplus unto the man to whom he sold it that he may return unto his possession. So this is this is talk, still talking about the land, right? So let's drop down to uh, the man. Let's go to verse 30, 35. Let's go back to, to verse 35. Shema. 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 Read. And if thy brother be waxen poor and fallen in decay with you, 
then you shall relieve him. Yea, though he be a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with you. Take thou no usury of him or increase, but fear thy Allahim, that thy brother may live with thee. So it's saying that if your brother be a stranger, what is he? How can my brother be a stranger? He's thought about he's from a different tribe. You don't know him, but he comes into your gates. You can he can serve you, but don't or, or you can lend to him, but don't charge him tax because he's an Israelite. This is how we try to tell people, according to the Torah laws, there's one Torah for the stranger and for us. But you see the difference. You can't charge me interest like I can the stranger. So for the sake of slavery, let's drop down to verse 20, 39. You see this too. Uh, am, I off, am I off when I, when I bring up how Father Yaquab had to go and work for Laban? Oh, uh, oh, how? What do you mean? As far as like he was waxing poor and he had went to, so he is considered like a stranger almost. But you know, granted, because that's that was really his uncle. His uncle was wicked. Like that was our uncle. Like our uncle was just wicked. Like yeah. I, you know, you know that he told he told him who he was. I'm your I'm your sister's son. Yeah. You that mean that they would have been in the same tribe? So in this case, that wouldn't apply kind of. to what he was saying, right? I mean, yeah, even, even, though, even though the tribes ain't established yet. Yeah. But. Yeah. But that's, see, that's what I'm saying. What he's saying don't really apply to what this law. That's on the mom's side. Because this is for us, and we get our tribes by our dad's side. Yeah, that's so why I'm it's, like, am I off? Yeah, it's not. It's not exact because our we're going from our. He's related to labor by his mom. He just did that because he just was that type of person. Just wicked. <laughs> so, let's go down to the slavery part, and this is what I thought Deuteronomy 28:68 was talking about. Real, real quick, was was Laban a Canaanite? Oh, what was Laban? Oh, Sarah was Sarah was a Canaanite. Rebecca, Rebecca said, "Go back to my land." Sarah was a Canaanite, and then Rebecca. So Abraham sent Eliezer back to, to, to Canaan. It's possible because I remember we did the the, the hand cover. Yeah. And Mother Rebecca covered her head. When yeah, she was coming. that she was that was her culture. Was it Israelite culture? Right. So she's so, some reason I thought you we were saying she was from Babylon, but I Babylon. Think. She's from Babylon. Okay. And well, because and that whole area belonged to Babylon. Yeah, the whole area. Yeah. And then again, being fair with the text, Babylon owned the whole region, but other nations was living there. Yeah. So we, I don't. I haven't found a exact pretext that says Sarah. Grandmother Sarah was actually a Canaanite. She just was a servant in, in Babylon. Okay. That's being fair. Okay. That's being fair. So the law of redemption for slaves. Verse 39. Verse 39. And if thy brother that dwelleth with thee be waxen poor and be sold unto thee, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bond servant, but as a hired servant and as a sojourner. He shall be with thee and shall serve thee unto the year of Jubilee. A sojourner is just like a temporary, mm -hmm. a temporary servant. So, uh, verse 41, you want me to keep going? Okay. okay, verse 41. And then shall he depart from thee, both he and his children with him, and shall return unto his own family and unto the possession of his fathers shall he return. Mm hmm. For they are my servants. They are who? They are my servants. The Most High said, listen, you can't make no Israelite be a, a indentured, a, a, a perpetual slave. So once your brother paid off his debt, the year of Jubilee, you release him and you release him back to his tribe because they are my, we are the servants of Yah. That's what the text is saying, family. Not the Protestant church, not the Catholic church, not the Lutherans. The children of Israel are the servants of Yah. Read on. And he definitely made a distinction between the two. He said, you shall not compel him to serve as a bond servant, Come. but as a hired servant. There's always a difference, family. We got, we got laws to keep us in order. That's why these pagans got hell coming, because you can't be the slave till he die. You can't be the slave till he die. That, that's wickedness. You know what that sounds like? It sounds like what we do now. And uh, 
It sounds like what we do now. Somebody get on hard times, what we do? Let them come stay with us. Come. <laughs> hey, come. It's, it's, it's funny that that's just how, how it is. It's just breadcrumbs. Breadcrumbs. Oh, jobs dry up in North Carolina? I got an auntie up in Jersey. Come on up here, I'll get you a job in a couple weeks. That's what we do. We don't stay around and sell drugs and rob and steal, prostitute ourselves. Pimp, I'm gonna pimp my sister. Well, you know, sis, we gotta eat. I need you to go out here. You gonna pimp your sister? One thing, too, that you see that's important is that the most high with his order, you know, he don't change his order. He want your tribes to be where they supposed to be. That's why he's like, send them back now. Send him. He done now. Now he need to go back to his land, his father's possessions. So if you're from Reuben, now you got to go back to Reuben, you know, et cetera, unless, you know, it was a woman who married to the, the other tribe. That's how he maintained the bloodline for one. That way no tribe overwhelms another. One tribe don't get stamped out. So for the sake of time, Let's drop down to verse 47. This is the law of redemption. Leviticus 25, verse 47. Read. And if a sojourner or stranger wax rich by thee, and thy brother that dwelleth by him wax poor, and sell himself unto the stranger or sojourner. So your brother is about to sell himself to one of the strangers that's living in our land. The strangers living in our land, they're following the same Torah. When we don't, we're not going to allow no stranger to come into Jerusalem, and you over here shacking up, fornicating, barbecuing hall. So you're a stranger in Israel, but you're righteous, so you can live with us. And now my brother has fallen down on hard times. I can't allow that. Read on. And sell himself unto the stranger or sojourner by thee, mm -hmm. or to the stock of the stranger's family. Uh -huh. After that he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him. Either his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him. Or any that is nigh of kin unto him of his family may redeem him. Or if he be able... He may redeem himself. So this is what I've been teaching Deuteronomy 28, 68 is talking about at the end here when it says that no man shall buy you. I've been teaching that this is saying the law of redemption is not going to happen. Nobody's going to come redeem you out of slavery. And family, that's false doctrine. That's not what this verse is saying. It, has, it said nothing like this. And let's get into it. Let's get into it. When you put it back in the Hebrew, it looks something like this. This verse looks something like this. And for the time being, for sake of time, today's I bar y'all roots, just focus on the last part, number nine. Just focus on the last part, number nine, and see if y'all can make out what's, what that last line says. Start on the right side and try to make up those two words. Anybody got a clue? Y'all about to get sharp with it. We got some swordsmen in here. These bugs get sharp with it. So it said, I, I was trying to uh, read it last night. But then go back. I just couldn't translate. Like I was trying to do the whole thing until so I could tell you what it what it was saying, but I couldn't get it all. I, I said I said the phonetics out. So that last line of Deuteronomy 28, it says, Wa yan wa wa yan kwana. Wa ayan kwana. And we're gonna break down and show you what this is saying. It's not saying no man shall buy you. And to catch these pagans lying, that's why we're doing textual criticism, showing you that. You just can't open up a Bible and think you have the Lord's word. Well, you probably do have the Lord's word. You have Bell's word. But um, all these brothers, Israelites, and Christians think they have the word of God in front of them. You have a daughter-rated text from the pagans. No Israelite had anything to do with these little books we call Bibles. So let's go back to our handy-dandy blue letter, right? This is the same verse in blue letter. Y'all see it there? Deuteronomy 28, 68. 
that block that block script i can read that but to me it's an abomination too it's saying the same thing but the underlying point you see where the yellow arrow is pointing that's the question and, and uh, that's the phrasing question here. And it says the same thing with the option saying, if you start on the on the uh, right side, right? But this is what I noticed many times in the Blue Letter Bible. You see when you parse out the verse? Blank spaces. I see it. You sharp as a tag today. What do you think, <laughs> Smokey? You smartest with the thing, boy. I, I be noticing that too. Like, and you don't, and then, then this thing is being in brackets. That means it's added, right? Clean it up. Yeah, you just made that up. You just made that up. So when you parse this out in Blue Nutter Bible, the phrase in and no man, well, no, and no man goes to Strong's H369 is Anya, uh, Ayan. We're gonna break down Ayan and see what that means. Then it says, shall buy. It's just one Hebrew word, kana or kwana. It don't even say shall. We don't, shall is not our language, but the word to, to acquire something is kwana. And then you, I was I would text and say you. What's the Hebrew word for you? Y'all know it yet? Ka, ka, or baraka. Thah, thah, thah. A thah, a thah is you. So if it says no man can buy you, we should say kwana thah. But it don't say you. Y'all just made that up. Y'all just added, like I said, it's in brackets. You just guessed. Like y'all guessed with Sador. You're reading our text guessing what the Hebrew is saying. Is that yellow uh, arrow? Is that a, a ma? That's a sa. That's a sa. I'm not sure why they put that there. They put the, um, I'm not sure why they put that side there. Or it's either a side or uh, because they got, when they change the, the, the language, they got beginning and ending letters. We don't change our letters because it's at the end of a word. This is all Greek stuff. So this phrase in question at the end, and no man shall buy you, it is adulterated. That's not what the father is saying, that no man shall buy us or no man shall redeem us. We're going to break down what he's saying. So that Strong's H369, this is a different uh, text, but you'll, you'll get to uh, learn them both. That character to the right, I guess that's an A. That little uh, apostrophe looking thing, that's what they're calling a Yah or a, the Yiddish is called it a Yo. That's the Y sound. And then that third one at the end, that's what they call a final end. We don't change the, the shape of our letters because they are at the end or beginning. That's all pagan stuff. But that's saying the same thing we would say in Hebrew, wa ayan. So the wa at the beginning is just a conjunction, an, an, an ayan. So this word is an ayan, an ayan. Now I gotta go back to the internet to show you how deep and, and sinister this is. I gotta go back to the internet to show you how deep and sinister this is. So that's the phrase we're about to take a look at how he ended Deuteronomy 28 to show you that they had daughter rated the text. The father was just saying, no man shall buy you. So, this is one of the lexicons I trust inherently. And I like this lexicon. I don't know about, I think I shared this with y'all many times before. Yeah. You have the Hebrew here. So if you're not strong in the Hebrew, you still can click on this Tinsdale tab. And you can go to the Wilson English, Englishman's Hebrew Dictionary, and you can look up English words, like uh, abolish. And they give you the Hebrew equivalent, and it gives you the, the scriptures that you can find the equivalent. So that's why I like this, this tool here, right? So we're going to look up for the Hebrew word ayan. Go back to Tinsdale, Hebrew. Is it shown on the screen pretty well? Uh -huh. So I, I click. Have to zoom in, bro. Okay, I click on the A right here. This is the A. This is the A right here. I click on the A, and then here is just like they taught us in school, the current catalog. The I, and I'm looking for the Y. I mean the the, uh, the Y. So A. This is A B. This is A B G. So I just scroll down till I get to the A Ys. 
A wise. Did I pass it? It's hard for me to, to tell. <laughs> you just, it's going to come in time. That's all. Uh, A Y. No, nah, that's the shot. Yeah, A A S. So you got to keep going. Up here. It should be right after the shot, right? It should be, it should be, it should be, it should be yeah, what a car. There's a false shot, this is the shot right here. Which is, uh, so I mean, you gotta go back up. What, is that a yard right there? I can't see it. That's a um, that's a raw that's a thing. Yeah, oh, here we go. Here we go. Boom. There, it is. Yeah. there we go. So this is the word in question here, family. Uh man, this ain't gonna play right. Hold on, let me see. No, I ain't got no reading mode. Oh man. All right. This is the word in question, right? And it starts right here. You see A, Y, N, I know it's hard to see. I know it's hard to see family, but this here's the A, there's the Y, and this is the final N, this is Ayan. Ayan, and this is Lakaya. None to you or for you. There is not to me. For I have not, I had not. So the word Ayan, doesn't mean no man shall buy you. Ayan is a negative for nothing, not something like also like I'm saying you will no longer be a people. Not not that, not that. So check. I caught him in a lie. So here's one of the, here's one of the examples here. This is the best one I could find here. Um. Ayan is, is always used with, with a, a, a noun. Um, boom. For there is no bread here, no nor water. So it would say, Kaya Ayan Lakam Wa Ayan Mayan. There is not bread and there is not water here. Ayan is not saying you should be, uh, no man shall buy you. Ayan, let's go back to the first. I, I thought I could put this in read mode, but check this out on your own time. The word Ayan is not saying no man shall buy you. The word Ayan is a negative for not or nothing. Not or nothing. Um, some more over here. So that's where you, you catch them in a lie and you got to kick it. You got to come back to your own language to understand what that verse is saying. So let's go back to the presentation to finish breaking this down and correct the false doctrine I've been teaching. When you put this back in the Hebrew, the Most High is not saying that no man can come redeem you. He's saying, and wa'ayan kwana. What is he saying, family? And there will be none something. None to rise up. He's saying you shall be bought for nothing. nothing. That's I thought you was about to say That's what I was thinking. I was like, man, I don't want to try. I guess. <laughs> 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 We're still learning. Because I was thinking, I was like, man, our, our people were sold off in these options for little to nothing. So what verse we got to prove that that's what 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 supporting text we got? Well, Joel we saying, or something like that. We were sold for a pair of shoes. I was just seeing three. Joel three. He said, three. "What you have sold my my children for wine?" For wine. And a pair of shoes. So we just expose these these pagans. That's why we can't trust your Bible. That's why we got to fast and pray. Abba, show me the truth. 
He's not saying no man shall buy you. Now these people on their little YouTube channel think they shoot us down. This ain't talking about y'all because y'all got bought, little nigga boy. It's not saying we shouldn't, we ain't gonna be bought. It's saying you're gonna be sold for nothing. Wine, shoes, wheat. Y'all said that's nothing. Look what you did to yourself. You have sold yourself for naught, he says. That's what the verse really says, family. So that's what I'm correcting false doctrine. Deuteronomy 28, 68 is not saying no man should come and redeem us. The most high saying, you want to sell yourselves because you broke my law, you're going to be sold for nothing of value. Nothing. They said it was when Rome came in 70 AD, it was so many Israelite slaves. He said, just give me two horses. Can you imagine little Elijah being sold for two horses? Can you imagine that? Huh? And you ain't got you ain't got no strength. Yes, sold two horses. That's what y'all said. You're gonna be sold for nothing. A holy people, because you don't want to keep my law. And you're gonna tell me that you just, I saved by grace. I was saying something. I'm gonna send it to you to watch at work, but I was thinking of I was like, I was like, he probably already riled up, but if he was one of the brothers, and it's it's those same groups of people, he was saying, like, that's why we still over here now, because we trying to keep the commandments. And that ain't how we supposed to be doing. I'm, I'm like, I know he, I know he ain't just say that. Man. Everybody with a smartphone could be a teacher. Y'all could be a teacher tomorrow. But if you really want to take some time and learn, and if you find that you jumped out there and you got things wrong, have a humble heart. I need to back up a little bit. I did that. I came out strong in 2016. Y'all spoke to me, gave my answer. I got a YouTube channel the next day. And I was sincerely teaching what I understood at the time. And then when I ran into a teacher who had more understanding, I was like, let me get off this YouTube, because I don't, I ain't as sharp as I think I am. And then when I got more understanding, more revelation, it ain't no, it ain't no race who gets the back design, who can teach first. Ah, I need them super chat money. Send me a super chat. Oh, send me a super chat. What is super chat's going to do when they got the army outside your house? So Deuteronomy 2868 is not saying no man shall buy you. It's saying you're going to be sold for nothing. You're going to be sold for wine, grain, rice, because you didn't want to keep my law. Wa'ayan kwana. Wa'ayan kwana. And then the nail in the coffin for you Bereans, the word ayan is not man. The word ayan is not man, and kwana means to buy. Where you get man from? What's the Hebrew word for man? Adam. Adam is one. Ash. Ash is nowhere in that verse. You see how we, we can't trust you for nothing. Hey, you ain't there if you just said that. Huh? You. And, and, the, and the word you is not there. So man and you ain't even there. Man and you is nowhere in a verse. Mm. But you got you got a doctorate, huh? So imagine the Greek then. What in the world? Like we go from the Greek to the I don't know this it's so much we probably just the most I just gonna have to just let us know. But that was the Old Testament. And praise Jesus. And one good son in the morning. My Savior came and dealt that Old Testament to the law. I'm free from the law. And I'm living my grace. I'm in one grace. The same thing is in the New Testament, family. Same thing is in the New Testament. Let's go to Matthew 23, verses 2 through 2 3. Show you the same thing. You can't, you, you live about a new, I, I'm a New Testament Christian. Ain't no such thing as a New Testament. This is why we trying to wake our family up. But like I told you, my mother, start saying goodbye, family. Because you and I, we whores and, and drug dealers and dropouts. You ain't wearing no suit. Y'all wear that in church? Yeah, this is what we wear. Well, why you ain't got no suit on? Show me suit in the Bible. Matthew 23, verse 2 to 3. Let's show the same thing happened inside the so-called New Testament. Read. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not you after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens. Oh, no, that's all we did. Where were you at, Al? Matthew 23, you said two and three? No, I must do, I, I see what I did. Just Matthew 2, Matthew 2. Uh, I read verse 2, saying, 
the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Come, therefore, I wanted Matthew 23 and 2. Okay. You want me to read verse 3 again? Come. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. Is this in red for y'all? Yes. So what did the pagans tell us if it's in red, family? Christ. This is Christ talking, right? And Christ is telling us, they sit, the scribes and Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they tell you to do, do, but don't do as they do, just do as they say. Anybody see a problem with that? Anybody see a problem with that? Why would you, it's almost like a country. It's like, why would you do it? it it's a, a, like, don't do what they do, but do what they say. But why would you do what they say if they ain't doing what they do? Sloppy. <laughs> well, that, 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 that sounds like a nigga is Don't do what I do, do what I say do. <laughs> so that can tell you after they they know they doing wrong. Absolutely. And, you know. You want me to believe you absolutely right, Abishai. You want me to believe that the king of Israel, Hamashiach, Yahweh Shai, gonna tell me, listen to these Pharisees, just don't do what they're doing. This sounds like a schizophrenic. Can we go to Matthew 15 and 3 out? So when I read it, like I said, just looking at the words and processing it in my mind. Verse, I'm going to read verse 3 again. Well, I'm going to read verse 2 and 3 again. Saying, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Mm -hmm. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe. So pay attention and listen to them. That, because there's a comma, you know, they they going off their language. Mm -hmm. That, observe and do. Now, this is just the way I would process it in my mind, but I know you're going to bring out even more. So whatever they tell you, listen to it, and then observe it, break it down in your mind, and do according to the Torah and righteousness. That, but, but do not be after their works, for they say and do not. So that's just the way I would process it if, you know, in my mind, even from a Christian perspective, like, okay, well, I wouldn't even say that from Christian perspective because we don't know how to read. But just now, looking at it, looking at the breakpoints with the comma and just processing it with the understanding that I have, that's how I would look at it in my mind. You remember that game on uh, Hot Bread and Butter? Y'all remember that game I told y'all about? Nariah is hot as a firecracker right now. I'll be moving toward the base because Nariah is hot. He's near the belt. He's near the belt. And to get the proof of this, you have to go back to what? The original language. I'm going to show you how the original language brings this out, what he just said. I'm going to show you what Nariah just said is dead on point. And now, but before we do that, let's just show with textual criticism. In Matthew 23, you want to tell me that the Most High is telling me to listen to these Pharisees, but everywhere else, he's running them down. Let's go to Matthew 15, 3, ah. Huh? Matthew 15 3, Shema. We about done, family. Read. But you told him here. You, you told me address. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of Yah by your tradition? So Hamashiach, our king, the lion of Judah, is telling these Pharisees, you're transgressing the law of Yah for the trans for the traditions of your, your rabbis, your fathers. If you're transgressing the law of Yah, what are you, family? A sinner. So you mean to tell me my king is going to leave a message for me by John to listen to sinners? You see how that doctrine makes no sense? You tell me Messiah is telling me to listen to sinners. Let's get one else. Let's go to John, uh, Matthew 15 and 14. Let's drop down a couple verses. It gets worse. Matthew 15 and 14. Wow. <laughs> you see this madness? Yeah. <laughs> see this madness? Uh, Matthew 15 and 14. Read. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. 
And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. So now you're telling me to, 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 to follow the blind. You got my king sounding like a schizophrenic. Listen to the Pharisees, but just don't do as they do. But now he's telling you they're blind guides. It gets worse, family. Let's go to John 8, 44. This is what y'all used to say in them games. Mighty blow. This is a finish them. Finish fatality. What y'all say fatality? Fatality. Fatality. Not more combat. Let's go to John 8 and, 8, 8 and 44. This is fatality right here. <laughs> John 8 and 44. Jermon, take your time. We about done. John 8 and 44. Read. Ye are of your father, the devil. Who? The devil. Not the devil. The devil. Uh-huh. And the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, the Torah, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. This is how much I was talking about the Fer uh, scribes and Pharisees. But you want me to read Matthew 23 and 2 and talking about they sit in the seat of Moses, whatever they tell you to do, do. And you done translated this from Greek. This is why we got to come back to our language. This is Matthew 23, 2 through 3, in our original native tongue. And he's saying, I'm starting at the top on the right. I don't know if I can make my mouse go over there. I don't think the present presentation will really go over there. Uh, uh -oh. It won't write. I'm starting at the top of the of the screen on the right side with the man with his hands raised. The man with his hands raised. Hi Shaparyam, hi Shaparyam, and Wa Parasham, the scribes and Pharisees. Ha Shaparyam, Wa Ha Wa Parasham, La Sha La Sha Sha La Sha La Sha Yam. I made up. Uh, did you skip? I think I skipped the uh, car. Yashabayam. Yashabayam. Come, come, that's where I'm at. So start from the top, top right. Hashaparyam, wa parasham, yashabayam, alaka masha. Laka, laka call, ashar, ya amorwa. Wa Amarwa, and that's all we need. Wa Amarwa. Hamashia is saying the scribes and the Pharisees, that second, that second row. I wish I had a pointer here. I wish I had a pointer here. That second row that starts with the arm, Yashabya, that means they're sitting. They're sitting in the picture of the eye, the picture of the eye and the L, that's Ayla. Inside, kasha, the seat. Kas, kasha is a seat. They're sitting in the seat of Masha. So then he says, laka, to you, call. To you, call, all they say to you, ashar is that. All that they say to you, the, the red arrow, ya amarwa. Wa, ya amarwa. It's saying, Ya Amarwa, Ya, that red Ya is a prefix for he. He. So it's saying all that he says in the Y to you, the Y at the end, the Y at the end is a suffix. The Y at the end is a suffix. It's the same of Moses. So Hamashia is not telling us to listen to the scribes and Pharisees. Like, like Nariah says, He's telling them they're sitting in the place of Masha. These scribes and Pharisees are supposed to be teaching y'all what Masha is teaching y'all. You don't need to listen to these scribes and Pharisees because you got the writings of Masha. Everything they say should be confirmed. They should just be witnessing to what Moses already told you. That's all, that's all Masha was saying. I mean, uh, Hamashiach was saying. If they're sitting in Moses' seat, you ain't got to follow them down a ditch. They're forsaking the law of Yah for their fathers, their rabbis. He says, so you got Masha's writings. You go to Shabbat every week. 
Don't worry about these scribes and Pharisees. He went to the land. I got sand from Jerusalem. Congratulations. I got a new book coming out. Congratulations. My new course is coming out. Get it at a discount, 45-45. Congratulations. That's what that man kept saying on that, that debate thing. He kept saying, well, y'all wrote, I already debunked that in my book. We don't care about, I care about your book. book. <laughs> That's your own thoughts. I was over there. Because usually before, I would be like, man, I'm turning this off. But like you told me, like, you just got to get through it so you can hear it. And I'm glad I did. I'm like, man, this stuff is cockamamie. <laughs> like, that's that's what you would say. But I was yes. like, yo, like, they say, these people, and he's, you know, probably know him, Rabbi. Yeah. Rabbi with an L. Just because you recording, but he, he called himself a rabbi. And I'm oh, like, what in the, I'm like, you, you are saying some crazy stuff. If you, if you can't put it back in the Hebrew, your book is garbage. Hamashak is saying that word, Yah Amorwa, the Yah is a prefix for he. So it's referring to he as in Masha, Moses. And it's saying, and the Y at the end makes it possessive for Moses. Wa, Yah Amorwa, you got his sayings. You don't need the scribes and Pharisees. You have Masha. And what proof do we got for that family? Uh, I give you. Well, Mr. Precepts, somebody bring it out. John. Yachanan 546. Yachanan, John 546. For had ye believed Moses, he would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if he believed not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? That's all Hamashiach was saying in the book of Matthew. He wasn't telling us to listen to no scribes and Pharisees, none of these super Hollywood Hebrews. You have the right of Moses. These people tell you to flee, flee, flee. He says, I'm going to gather my sheep from the four corners. He don't need your help. So all these scribes and Pharisees family, this textual criticism is showing you, you just can't open up the Bible and think you got understanding. If you don't come back to the original mother tongue, you're not gonna have understanding of the Old or New Testament. I don't care how sharp they are. I don't care how y'all speaking, y'all y'all know what y'all saying. We, we can, everything up there on that screen, we can break down in context. You break down your Yiddish, break down your English, break down your Greek, you can, because those languages are dead. This Yah Amor it makes sense. The Yah is the prefix for he. Amor is sayings. How do we get sayings out of that? Because the first ah is either the first or the strength of the flow coming from who? The man. Coming from the man, my sayings. My word is what? My word is bomb. I'm going to be there at 5 o'clock to pick you up. I'm going to be there at 5 o'clock to pick you up. The strength of the flow of my sayings. So everything we're teaching and learning here makes sense. Just like that, um, when, if you go back to the uh, where you had the written uh, letters up there, the one with the I, I uh, Alas, Alakas, 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 Alakas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that word to me when I was looking at, it, I was like continually leading. Like, cause he's yeah. saying the Pharisees are, they, right. they're they leading the people. I'm sorry too, I, I got tired last night. So that Allah is really a prefix. So it's really a word by itself. Oh, okay. Kasa, so, Kasa is the root, Kasa Allah, means a Kasa. chair. So Allah, you can see that Allah means, like you are saying, continually, continually in authority or leading. Yeah. So that's a prefix there, fam. I should have yeah. put it in a different color, I underlined it. But I was getting tired last night. So, so like, yeah, he's, yeah, yeah. Continuing to lead in the, in, in in the, the chair in the or the seat of Moses. of Moses. But then he was saying, don't listen to what they say because you got Moses' writings. You you, you don't have to. What, what pretty much what he's saying, what, what the king is saying, when I come back, you ain't going to have no excuse about scribes and Pharisees that you are straight because straight, you had my Masha. So all these people following these YouTubers and these superstars, and my Moray says, you ain't got to keep the law, and the law is just ceremonial, and the law is just uh, uh, cultural. cultural. Book, chapter, and verse, superstar. So you ain't going to have these excuses when, uh, when Hamashiach comes because you got what Moses wrote. Whatever the Most High wrote for Moses with his finger, 
You got to show me the verse where y'all says, I don't care about that no more. Uh-huh. Only thing we got black and white that we can say y'all says he had enough of is animal sacrifice. Animal sacrifice. Cause that was obvious when, when that veil rent in the temple after, now of course this has been told after the fact. Someone had to tell them, hey, what time did y'all slay him? Because I went to the temple and the veil was rent. And every educated Israelite knew that was our sacrifice. So that's when, when people can't give you receipts and, and they make these statements, I entertain you, but you got to put it together like we just put that together. When you just put stuff on the screen with transitions and, and now, miss me with all that. Miss me with all that. I don't film up top. I know if he was talk fast and see, yeah, yeah, ho, 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 ho. You bought a brand new Benz for $20,000? Yeah, I talked them down. Where are you buying a Benz for $20,000? So that's what these teachers are doing. And then you got a big old council up here. Of, that's all they're saying. It's, it's easy to see. Anybody can see that. Well, I ain't anybody. I'm dumb as bricks. Yep. I need receipts. And that's what these teachers should be doing for y'all, whether it be online or you going to other assemblies. You should, hey, hey, I don't see that. Or what about this? It's nothing wrong with entertaining questions. And if you don't know, you don't know. But make everybody give you receipts whether online or in, in the physical room, give receipts. Hamashiach wasn't telling us that these were scribes and Pharisees. Hamashiach was telling us, you have the saints, Hamashiach, listen to what Masha wrote or what I wrote for Masha. Hallelujah. With that, family, that's all I got. This is textual criticism, uprooting Christianity. I don't even know what part we're up to. We just, we got to keep, this is just the tip of the iceberg because we got to get into, we got to get into how they compose the Bible. Like, I got the names. I got the names of the people who gave you the Bible. So I don't know how, how much longer we're going to be on this. I, this is the most high. This book here, you can borrow this anytime. This, he's a, he's a Hasidic, Khazar, but he, he brought it out. Like, he's ragging on the Christians. He was like, you Christians are following this Greek Jesus, and when you put those sayings of the New Testament back in Hebrew, your Jesus ain't saying nothing that the Messiah talked about. Now, the, the Hasidic rabbis, they consider Hamashiach just to be a prophet. So some of his sayings, they believe, but what he's trying to tell the Christians in this book, you can call on that Greek Jesus, he ain't say nothing y'all thought he said. <laughs> like we just exposed today. Hamashiach wasn't telling us to follow the Pharisees. He was telling us to follow the Hamashiach. And with that thing, I yield, I open up the floor for questions, comments, and concerns. Just to, just to comment on what you just said right then, we know Christianity is the spirit. Huh. So the spirit of Jesus and the Lord is on our people that follow that doctrine. And just like any other spirit, any other unclean spirit, you use a spirit of perversion, lust, for the sake of the example. Mm-hmm. And Speaking from a perspective of being a younger guy and having to deal with these certain circumstances, you know, I'm not going to get as graphic. I'm going to use anger, another spirit that I had to deal with when I was younger. When you, it, it were times where you could say something to me and I would get so angry that my body would get hot because my blood would be boiling mm-hmm. like that. That's what calm means. Ham, Ham's name is really calm. That's when we get the word calm down. So, and our people deal with this stuff, and everybody has that breaking point. But, you know, over time, if you don't deal with it, it's just going to continue to boil and boil and boil. It's like, you know, pressure, bust, and pipe. Right. So when that thing finally come out and you let loose, whether it be a verbal assault on somebody, physical assault, when you do something crazy, as soon as, it, as, soon as you let it out, that spirit leaves you. Huh. Now you got to deal with whatever collateral damage has been done through that spirit. It's the same thing with Christianity. The spirit that's on our people, as soon as whatever is done or executed in the earth by the spirit, that spirit won't forsake them. 
and they're going to get sobered up and realize what have we been doing this whole time? That's why Daniel was like, some people are going to wake up to everlasting life and some going to wake up to everlasting shame and contempt because everybody's going to be sobered in that day when come. King Halishai come back. And it ain't going to be like a lot of people thought. <laughs> so that's what was on my mind when you just said that right there. All praises. This, for you, those are just coming in. I'm not, I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm saying this because this is what they never told us in church when we got saved. They told us when we got saved that you're into the family and now Jesus loves you and your whole life's going to change. And that's not the truth when you come in. And, what, what's this, what is this a to? If you come to serve Yah, prepare thy soul for temptation. <laughs> Don't think that you're crazy because up one day you're up, one day you're down, one day you're lonely, one day you and your wife is at odds, you and your husband. Don't, this is the walk, family. So if you're soft-hearted, you're gonna turn away when they turn up the heat. So this is the this is what we're engaged in. And you have to be strong, you have to endure to the end. All these savages you've been doing, all these feasts you've been sacrificing for, all these assemblies you've been supporting, if you fall at the fourth quarter, it's all for nothing. Oh, bro. Hamashek saying, well, I gave, I, I, I went to 10 Shabbats, I, I, I went to 10, it don't matter. You, you gave up when they came with that needle. You gave up when they took your house. And you told them that you would bow down to the government. So that's why we do all this teaching to stir your faith up. And, and I want to warn you so you be on guard. You should go to work every day looking for Satan. Because that's what I do. Where you coming? I know you come. He's a supervisor going to act crazy. Or one of you, one of you, my co-workers going to act crazy. I'm going to have to put you in the pocket. Because I know y'all had the devil in y'all. Yep. You should wake up looking for Satan because he's looking for you. Yep. He's looking for you. Not because you're special, because you're trying to keep the law. We just came out of Christmas. Anybody have problems with the family? Yep. Yeah. Every year. Every Thanksgiving. You, you just can't come by? I know y'all got the little cute. I know everybody wants to see him. Yep. Bring the baby by. You ain't got to eat. Just bring the baby by. Can I, can I, can I, can I take pictures with him and little Santa suit? No, you want to defile my child? How much should I come by? He taking a picture with you and send a suit. Happy shall he be when he dies. <laughs> this is a hard walk, family, and you need you in the military. We call them battle buddies, and a, a battle buddy is your homeboy who you know he's squared away. He ain't no dunce. He's sharp with his, his weapon. He know how to clean his weapon. So you want to pick your battle buddy that you see. He ain't lazy. He's sharp. He's intelligent and he's loyal. That's what you need in this walk. You need your battle buddy that you can call on. Ah, man, I ain't feeling it today. Ah, man, something that came over me, man. You need a battle buddy so you can release to because there's a lot of burden carrying this stuff by yourself. The devil wants you to think you all by yourself suffering with these different attacks. You ain't by yourself. The whole nation is suffering attacks. That's what he wants you to think that you by yourself. Divide and conquer is an old tactic. Calm. So that's all I got. Any, any other questions, comments, and concerns? What was the name of the author of that book? Which, which book? Uh, which book, Jody? I'm not sure. I missed that one. So if there's, huh, you got something? Uh, I think it, I don't know if it was the, the Bible that she thought of, or was, if it might have been another book. It was the book that you held up. Uh, the Hebrew Yeshua and Greek Jesus. I'm not sure. I didn't see. I didn't see it very well. Let me. See. Yeah, turn. Around. Thank you. Uh, that, that's common sense. That boy's smart. That should be like this one right here says. Yes, Khan. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, he's a uh, Kazar named uh, nah Nahank. Now, Nia, he's trying to call himself Nehemiah Gordon. He has a whole website you can go to full of Nehemiah Gordon is his name. Nehemiah Gordon. The Hebrew Yeshua versus the Greek Jesus. And uh, it, it has some, a lot of good information in there. You still got to weed it out because they, they still try to claim our heritage. So 
Uh, other than that, that's all I got. Uh, thank you all online for your attention. Thank you for joining us. And I just want to put this out there, family. Don't accept nothing here as gospel. You got to take this home. The videos, I try to get them uploaded by Monday or Tuesday. So when you hear stuff for the first time, it's shocking. You could be distracted trying to research something else. I know that's what I do when I watch videos. I'm listening to them, but I'm, I'm, I'm like five minutes back trying to, trying to find that verse. Like, so that happens inside the bio. So when the video's uploaded, you go back and you verify this stuff. These ops been been here now, I think, for a year. Everyone's been here more than a year. They can tell you. I don't play no games about our nation, but I'm approachable. If I if I miss something, I'm like, no big deal. Like, thank you. That I want other brothers on the front line to keep us sharp. That's not it's iron shop for iron. So all these teams out here puffed up for what? If anybody want a piece, take the spot, please come take it. Please, I go back to playing ball, working on my stocks and bonds. Please, please. So I don't know what some teachers get offended. Someone correct them, or I, I don't know that. I think it's just pride. But here, we want everybody verify for yourself. If you find something, an old document, say, "Hey, hey, I, like, what is? It? Let's bring it out. Let's bring it out." So, with that said, we're going to uh, stand in faith.